good start. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, calling to order the meeting of the Amherst School Committee on Tuesday, October 5th at 6.30 p.m. And we'll begin with roll call attendance. When I call your name, please say present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. Um, and we also have um, Ms. Scott as our recorder and Dr. Morris um, joining us this evening. Um, our first item on our agenda is um, approval of the minutes um, from September 21st, and those are attached in the in the agenda packet. Mr. Deming. Um, I will plead mea culpa that I had trouble finding where the minutes were. I'm sure that you've, I'm sure that I've been told before, but I couldn't find it on the board docs um, agenda item. So I'm sure this is user error, um, but if, if, if we wouldn't mind tabling those, um, mostly if we have an urgency to approve those, that would, I would appreciate that. Sure. Um, are you able to see them right now? Uh, on board docs? Yeah. Um, so give me one second. So if I go to the meeting and then I view agenda approval of minutes. So I don't see like a doc there. It's not it's, in the it's doc. Just... If you it's above the line that says public content, there's an item that says minutes. Do you not see that? I, I think I'm in a different. Again, yeah, this is user errors. So. <laughs> So I believe they're posted in a way where school committee members can access them, but they're not in the public site. Um, so I think if Peter is, um, like I typically do, unless I'm adding a document, is on the public site, I think they were added. There's no critique, just in a way where they're not, um, they're not like the attachments on the public site, like in the other parts, I believe. So meaning um, we need to be logged in as, um, logged in in order to be able to see the minutes. Well, there's two other people who are smarter than me with their hands up. So I'll just okay, uh, Ms. Spitzer. So I, I I had a minute, to, it took me a minute too. If if you go down to the minutes, there's like a little clock view and it says view minutes. And if you click on view minutes, you can see them. I had been used to downloading them as like a Word document and that's not how they are this time. So I, I'm with you, Peter. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Mr. Demley. So, Ms. Spitzer, if you could, so was that, is that on the public site? Because I think if it's not, we should definitely go back to posting them publicly like we used to. Um, now I see Dr. Morris has them. <laughs> so they are on the public site, but as opposed to the other attachments, you have to, you can't just like casually look, you sort of have to click into it to then click the minutes. It's not the other ones where you see that there's an attachment next to it with the little icon of I don't know how to say it, but you know, the little attachment icon that Board Docs uses, it's not there. So you have to click and then click again. So it is accessible to the public, but I think probably unless you were looking for it, you wouldn't necessarily know that attachment was uploaded, if that makes sense. Would it be helpful if I share my screen? Yeah. We'll table the approval just to be clear, but just so, because <laughs> if, if folks are watching at home and are wondering the same thing, so. Um, I will hang on just one sec. So are you seeing my, my board doc screen? Yeah. So as Dr. Morris was just saying, so items that have actual attachments, you see the little file icon, but on minutes, when you click onto the item right here where it says minutes, and as, as uh, Ms. Spitzer was saying, there's the little clock and then you click on view minutes and then it should pull it up. So we will table this approval for now um, and come back to it at our next meeting. Mr. Demley. Again, this may be user error, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not seeing that on the public site. Um, Dr. Morris. So it is working. I mean, I have the public site up and it 
it appears to be the same. Um, I mean, I can share my screen. Okay. But take my word for it. I'll follow. Um, I've wasted enough. Time. I'll yeah. follow up later. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So uh, next up, we have. So just as a reminder, we'll come back and approve those at our next meeting. Um, next up is uh, public comments. Um, and before we have um, a couple voice messages and um, and a and a document that is that is attached as um, a, um, a file document on this agenda item. Um, but one of the other things I added to this was a link to our policy. And so I wanted to take a moment to review our policy on public participation at our meetings. Um, like I said, that link is included there. Um, we revised this policy a little over a year ago to broaden the ways that our public can provide comment in our meetings, but other aspects of the policy were maintained or refined. Um, one key aspect is a stipulation that topics of comments should be limited to items that are within the school committee's scope of authority. And because the, S the school committee doesn't have direct authority over any staff or personnel other than the superintendent, comments and complaints regarding um, other school personnel are generally prohibited unless those comments and complaints concern matters that are within the scope of the school committee authority. And that's a reading um, from the policy. I'm reminding us of this now because we did receive four voice messages in the last week for public comment that were impacted by this. The messages each expressed significant concern about a police presence with a comfort dog in our schools. But since the comments centered around complaints about individual staff that are not under the school committee's direct authority, I referred those complaints to the superintendent and have not included them in tonight's public comment. Um, and with that, um, I will play, start with the voice messages and then move on to the, um, the written comments. Barbara Veresca. I am a Fort River parent and Amherst resident. Um, I'm calling to urge you to wait until fall 2023 to move sixth graders to the middle school. Um, while I do understand the current and future space needs, you know, my own daughter's in the cafeteria this year, um, especially with COVID reconfigurations. Um, I still feel that moving in fall 2022 will just be adding stress to the students, teachers, parents, administrators, facility personnel, and school staff, um, all of whom have weathered the COVID disruptions, um, which aren't even over yet. We don't even know what may be to come. Um, it's just too much to ask in too short a time frame. Please give everyone the chance to plan, adjust, and make decisions based on more information, and to be able to prepare for a successful, well-thought-out transition in the fall of 2023. Thank you. Hello, my name is Irene LaRoche. I live in Sunderland, and this is a statement for public comment. I am a teacher and union representative at Amherst Regional Middle School. I would like to read this statement from the APEA representative of the middle school about the possibility of moving the sixth grade to the middle school. We thank the school committee and the district for their consideration of delaying this decision. We also thank the district for sending a survey for staff in September. We have heard from many of our members that they were not able to complete the survey because they did not feel as if they had enough information after viewing the slideshow slide presentation, they still had too many unanswered questions. Also, Unit C staff shared that they do not have easy access to computers to respond. The APEA representatives of ARMS would like to offer to the district our collaboration on creating a future survey and identifying information that will assist staff in completing it. We believe this is an important decision for our community. The union is not taking a position one way or the other at this time, but value the opportunity to share our expertise and input. Thank you for your time and consideration. I 
I'm now sharing the document that um, also is attached um, to the agenda packet. Um, so folks can read this, read along at home. So it's mentioned that um, that document is included um, in the agenda packet attached to the public comment item in um, on board docs. And with that, um, next up is the superintendent's update and I will turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure, I will try to be as thorough and brief. I know I understand it is a baseball game some people care about and they wanna care about our agenda too. So I'll try to balance those two. I'm not a baseball fan. And so Yaffe may be excited to watch the game tonight. Uh, thanks for coming here, Nick. But uh, We'll, we'll try to do our best. Um, so um, first thing, I just want to thank um, Jennifer Reese, our science coordinator, um, K-6 science coordinator. Uh, as part of the last, the, she applied and we worked and got a garden grant from the Whole Kids Foundation. Um, they're offering schools a hydroponic farm stand grow tower, uh, which I know some of our schools are accessing to have more experience uh, with that uh, in our buildings. So just, you know, a lot of the focus of the garden program has been outdoor learning for obvious reasons, but it's um, kind of neat to think about uh, all the different ways that we can integrate science into the curriculum. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, thanks for folks who are engaging in that. Um, second thing I wanted to mention was a couple of years ago, uh, a regional school committee, so you all sit on the region, approved a sabbatical for um, performing arts teacher John Bechtold. He worked with a theater company called Punch Drunk, and one of the things that uh, was in his proposal was to come back and to work with elementary or facilitate um, opportunities for elementary school students. And he's doing that uh, with a program called A Small Tale, which is a teacher-led adventure. Um, it involves a lot of literacy as well as dramatic activities. Um, so he's making that available. I know some of our schools are, are jumping right into that uh, in a really interactive way. So thank you, John, for he's a secondary teacher, but he's contributing to uh, integrating the arts into literacy at the elementary level. Um, third thing I want to share is that, you know, I received some feedback um, uh, last week or so. Uh, we have a longstanding uh, kind of uh, relationship with Winston, who's the comfort dog from the Amherst Police Department. 
uh, some really legitimate concerns about, uh, you know, what that meant, not so much the dog, but police presence on, on campuses, elementary school campuses. So uh, we've decided to pause that program. You know, um, I think some of the family mem families who have gotten in touch with me had, you know, concerns there wasn't an opt-out option, I guess. And so we're just taking a break from that and, and really reconsidering the options and hearing more feedback on that. So uh, it wasn't like a kind of scheduled part of the week where it came for an hour at a time. It was, it was much more uh, casual, um, you know, on the flip side, many students really enjoy, enjoyed it. There was a great uh, article, I thought, that really showed a lot of different perspectives last year in our high school newspaper, because it's not just the elementary schools. Um, so it wasn't a new program, but we got some new feedback that's making us consider uh, how we want to move forward. So at this point, the program is paused, and before we take any next steps, we would be communicating with the community as well as the committee. Um, on Saturday, we had the um, Latino Heritage uh, Month celebration. It was behind the high school. It was uh, really it went um, it was outstanding. Thanks to Katie Richardson and many others, we had our students, high school students, involved in organizing, planning, and participating in the event as well as well as some elementary staff, particularly the staff from Comandantes, who uh, led a number of activities for students. There was music. Um, it was great. It was uh, you know people stayed for a long you know sometimes you have these events and people stop in for 20 minutes and this one people stayed for hours because they're really enjoying themselves. So thank you so much for our staff who participated in that and organized it and the and the band was great and Mr. Sadiq I give him credit he showed up and uh, was sitting in the wrong seat or the right seat depending where you think about it got called up by the band to to dance along with them and he's a wonderful sport. So I know it's an elementary committee but I think he deserves as many acknowledgments as he could because I sat in the opposite kind of seat where I would not get called up. So um, appreciate Mr. Sadiq for being there and, and uh, participating. Uh, tomorrow night, we have uh, medical experts, uh, our third panel with them. Um, this time it's really thinking about um, COVID safety as we head towards winter, uh, you know, and, and more in, indoors um, things are forced upon us by the weather, as well as the, you know, vaccine work. And as the vaccine is expected in the next, you know, frankly, even in the next month or so, to be considered. I know there's a date for an FDA review that's coming up in three weeks, a little less than three weeks, actually. Um, you know, talking a little about that with the community ahead of time. Um, and so they've been a great resource for the committee. That's eight o'clock, or in the community, that's eight o'clock tomorrow night. Um, open houses are coming up. We are doing them virtually and primarily uh, synchronously so that there can be two-way communication. Crocker Farm and Wildwoods are on October 14th and Fort Rivers on October 13th. Um, we have a lot more tents. Uh, so our schools, we've invested some uh, stimulus funds. We have a lot more, and they're not as big so that we don't have the same, you know, kind of challenges with approvals and permissions. Um, but we bought a, a large number of tents. They're um, worked, um, the facilities department's worked with principals about location for them. I know Fort River got them up over the weekend because they wanted to get them up before this week. And uh, I was at one of the schools today and I see them being used widely. Um, so thank you to the facilities department for identifying tents that would come and, and some creative uses of them, like linking them together. So even though they're small tents, they, they function as a larger tent uh, group uh, for students. And as you know, we've had a lot of rain this week and uh, it may be uh, continuing at some point, although I think the, the rain will go away for a couple of days now. Uh, it's a great resource for us. So thank you to our facilities department for that. We are redesigning our website, um, kind of soft redesign. That should be uh, hopefully launched by the end of the month. That's our target date with a, a lot more user-friendly content as well as kind of some distinguishing. We have so much information because legally we have to on the website, trying to distinguish a bit between uh, different roles and what you'd be looking for. And so I saw a sneak peek of it. I think it's a lot more attractive and a lot more user-friendly. So I think by the end of the month, we'll have it. And then today uh, we had the installation of something that I'm going to try to share my screen and show. Let's see if I can do this successfully. There it is. So um, this is a communication board at Wildwood. It's at the Wildwood Playground, and Wildwood, as as many of you know, has the ILC program for um, students who you know many students who struggle significantly with communications. Many of them use a communication board, either literal or you know, via a technological device. So this is just something that uh, was an idea that we were able to integrate in so that students at Wildwood who do need to use this um, to communicate at recess have a way to do it that's not, um, you know, wearing an iPad around while you're on the playground is not the easiest thing. And so um, this side's done. 
the other side in Spanish is coming soon because uh, the back side will be um, in Spanish. So we think this will increase the access. We talk a lot about accessibility uh, in ways that are physical, but there's also in terms of accessibility in terms of communication. So many, many people were involved in putting this together. So it's pretty neat. And I'm gonna, I tried to make it over today. It started raining heavy. I know I wouldn't see kids outside. And I kind of, I mean, it's neat to see, but the picture is just as good as seeing it in person. I was more interested in seeing the use of it. Uh, so I think I'll try to head over uh, later this week and see it, but you know, really exciting for us. So I thought the visual was better than uh, me speaking in theory about it. And that's my updates. Those are my updates for this evening. Thank you. Comments or questions? Mr. Demling? Um, thank you for showing the communication, board. That is awesome. Um, it's really great to see. Um, so who, who is involved in, in advocating or, or working on that, if, if you don't mind? I mean, that's just, it's just a great new thing to, to see that we might not have all expected was even, was even a possibility. Yeah, I mean, I know Faye Brady was, and I know our facilities department was, um, and I'll make some, I'd like to make some assumptions of other people involved, but I actually, uh, the funny thing about it was I saw a picture of this somewhere else, I think on social media at a school out of state, and I sent it to Faye, and Faye said, oh, we're doing that, and I said, oh, that's great, um, so uh, you can tell that I deserve no credit for this, it's really about the staff, uh, I do know that families in the past have advocated around this, particularly at Wildwood, particularly because of the ILC program. So I imagine that was the case, but um, it all together it came together from my end pretty quickly as something that would be helpful. Uh, but I know our facilities department was actively involved in, you know, uh, and I'm sure Mr. Yaffe and Ms. Estes were uh, as well in terms of the school staff. But I, but I know Faze with my conduit who's been talking to me frequently about it. So we're excited to get it going. Other comments? Nick, did you have anything you wanted to share on that topic since you're here with us tonight? Oh, Nick, you're muted. It's been, a, it's been a while since I've been in one of these meetings. Hi, everybody. Um, well, you mentioned, Mike, that it was an AEF grant, right? Yeah. I so neglected I think, to mention that from last yeah, year. My apologies. Thank AEF. you very much. Yes, and a, thank our AEF partners, and certainly Faye Brady, who's a champion, but also Chris Cusick, who's the coordinator of the ILC program. A shout out to him and to our ILC staff. Thank you. Yeah, it was so an, they, it was, they deserve all the credit. Yeah, and this was an application, as you know, it's an, a, an application process uh, for AEF, and it was something that was advocated for yeah. last year. Thank you for that uh, refresher. I appreciate it, Nick. And what's awesome is I just was out there too, Mike. It's like it's at kid level. So I just am so looking forward to the conversations that are going to happen with the typical ed children as well and looking at it and touching it and it's it's very like in engaging enticing so yes. i'll just add one quick comment about the open houses and i think that's a great um uh add this year to make them synchronous online um because that was it was great to still have open houses last year but to have them synchronous and enable that two-way conversation was fantastic so thank you everybody who's working hard to make that happen you know that isn't easy <laughs> any other comments or questions no okay thank you um Next up is a chair's update, and um, I don't have an update for this evening. Um, any school committee announcements? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Um, so we will move on to new and continuing business. And um, uh, I guess some of us have bad internet connection, um, so uh, dropping off and coming back in. Um, first up on our new and continuing business is the um, possible sixth grade move to the middle school. Um, and um, trying to connect to that, yeah. Um, so we'll be considering a motion that's included in the agenda item. Um, uh, to move sixth grade to the middle school with the timing that uh, Dr. Morris recommended um, at our last meeting, which um, would be for the fall of 2023. Um, and before I turn it over to, I see we have some, some guests joining us. Um, thank you. 
Um, I wanted to start, go back to some context. This is the third time this school year that we're talking about it, but it's by no means the third time that this group has, has discussed this um, or considered this. this um, the presentation that we've looked at at the last two meetings is included in the packet. Um, it's the same presentation that we looked at at our um, forum, uh, was that two weeks ago? Um, and within that it presentation is a link to a report from the Grade Span Advisory Board. And that was, I, I think, sort of one of the middle steps or intermediate steps in this, this multi-year process and, and conversation. Um, and I mentioned that because that, that report is over 50 pages long, um, definitely well worth digging into um, for community members if you haven't looked at that yet. Um, and I, I want to mention that because the group worked together for many months. Um, I was part of that group um, to consider that move. And their work, as you see in the presentation, began well before COVID adjustments created the severe space constraints that we now have or face in our schools. Um, and I mention this because I received some concerned feedback from some of the um, other, some of my colleagues that were on that advisory board that um, they thought the report was being represented as a recommendation in support of the move. Um, and as you'll see in that report, there's actually no recommendation made. And in fact, the group was instructed specifically not to make a recommendation, but to explore the pros and cons um, of such a move, as well as the pros and cons of keeping sixth grade in the elementary school. Um, and I think, you know, the group included parents, um, community members, staff from elementary schools, staff from um, the middle school, um, and, and district staff as well, and really invested many hours exploring the topic and put together, I would think, I would say, my opinion, a com very comprehensive pros and cons um, for both. Um, obviously, um, as I mentioned, COVID adjustments have created new wrinkles in, in this um, that were not considered within that report. And I, and I um, know that that's par part of what we'll be hearing about a little bit tonight before we begin our, our deliberation and potential vote. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morris um, and team for further introduction. Sure. So thank you and thanks to Derek, Nick and Michelle for being here tonight. Um, I'll do an introduction, then I'll turn it over to them to describe a little bit of the building. But in the end of the day, you know, like the core concept is the motion that's being made is the same as what was proposed at the end of the last meeting, you know, when we did the second public forum. Um, it continues to be to make the transition in the fall of 2023 um, for the same reasons. Um, I think we heard a lot from members of the public um, and a lot of feedback that I agreed with, frankly. Um, at that forum, as well as somewhat in the forum before, although there was more people in the second forum, I believe, than the first forum. And so, um, you know, the reason I asked uh, the three elementary principals in Amherst to come tonight was specifically that there were some comments or feedback or questions that I think is best answered by them, which is what is the reality on the ground of waiting a year in terms of the space crunch in our schools? And I think what you'll hear from them that things are very challenging right now with the space constraints, and particularly at uh, Fort River, it'll get that much more challenging next year as an extra class uh, comes online. And, and, and I think there's challenges at all three schools. You know, I think collectively, uh, we all came to the same conclusion that the space needs will be challenging. And yet we didn't feel like we had sufficient time and, and space, given the pandemic in particular, to make uh, this larger transition for the next school year. But we wanted to be honest and transparent with the committee and the community what school might look like next year in the last year of a K-6 to scenario if the committee decides to go forward with the motion that's being proposed tonight. Um, before I open it up for the uh, elementary folks to jump in, the principals to jump in, are there any questions for me um, before they talk a little bit about space? Okay. So I think what I'll do is ask them to spend just, you know, a short amount of time, but just describing some of the space constraints, the implications this year, what if it will look any different next year. Um, we don't know exactly what enrollments would be, but we can anticipate that. Uh, we can talk about that, and then maybe I'll kind of come back to my larger, um, the motion, why I'm supporting this motion in a little more detail. Does that sound okay for the chair that first talk about space and then, and then kind of get to the motion specifically? Okay. So again, because there was questions last week at school committee that I thought were very legitimate need to be answered, I think we'll go in, in alphabetical order by school so that I'll have Mr. Shea describe a little bit of 
space constraints this year at Crocker Farm? Um, any implications that might be different next year? And then we'll go to Fort River and, and, and with Wildwood and see if there's questions. But uh, we're not going to do the same as we did in, in the summer where we did the huge space, you know, with maps and everything. We're just describing what are the implications? What, what, uh, what are some challenges, particularly on days like we had bad weather the last couple of days uh, where, where outside is less of an option? Um, and then again, looking forward. So Mr. Shea, we could uh, ask you to start us off. Um, sure. Um, can I just make a baseball comment quickly? Or is that, are we in a hurry? Um, th there, there's not a lot of baseball in the playground at uh, Crocker Farm these days. There's um, basketball, soccer, kickball. Um, there's a lot of tag. There's a lot of playing in the swings, the slides. Four square is really popular. Um, but not a lot of uh, baseball. So I'm just saying, I don't know what that means, but um, happy to work on it if that's a problem. Um, I hope the uh, home team wins tonight. Um, so uh, Cocker Farm this year, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go as quick as I can. Um, there's approximately um, 360 students at Crocker Farm School this year, including pre-K through six, um, somewhere in the region of 55 pre-K um, school. And I forget the name of the new program. Uh, Mike can probably say it out loud better than I can. Early, early Childhood Center at Crocker Farm. Early Childhood Center, 55. So uh, 305 K through six, probably somewhere in the region of um, anywhere in, in any uh, day, 80 to 100 staff members. And, and that's, I could talk about that in a second. Um, I would say an old fashioned way of saying it is we're pretty full to the brim. You know, I mean, we're, we're pretty tight. Um, not a lot of room for, 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 for additional space. There's 23 classes, if you include 18 classrooms for K through six and five preschool classes. Um, I'll just identify a couple of crunches and again I'm, i don't want to complain terribly because i mean i come from a pretty you know different background where where we didn't have as much but but certainly it's, it's tight um you know we've got one specials uh teacher technology that teaches in the classroom these days because we don't have a technology room we, we utilize the technology room for a, a staff break room um because we for for, for covid reasons uh, makes it a little bit delicate for teachers being able to find a space to do their prep because their classrooms used but Right now, with the good weather, people, teachers have been outside. Um, we, we have a fairly decent number of special education, uh, both part-time and full-time um, specialist teachers. So for example, um, OT, PT, speech and language, specialized reading, um, you know, hearing impaired, visually impaired uh, teachers. And it's very difficult to find appropriate space for, for um, those teachers who sometimes need a smaller space to work with the students. So that becomes a bit of a daily grind. And, and um, sometimes I feel, terribly bad about letting people down. You know, we use the cafeteria and various other spaces, but it's pretty tight in terms of finding um, spaces for, for those folks. Instrumental music is, is a bit of a laugher because I think they just go wherever, the hallway or wherever. They were all in there today and trying to do their best. Um, you know, there, there's definitely, um, Mike, it's, it's, I, and, and I don't want to complain because I know Fort River and Wildwood's got other challenges and, and folks out there, um, I, I think, it, perhaps maybe get a little bit better next year because we'll have three sixth grade classes leaving and, and then theoretically we'll have two kindergartners come in. Um, so it may help us a little bit. Uh, if I could just make one other plug you know, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll stop is that certainly the other thing, Mike, and, and I know you know this and the committee knows this, but the, the building was certainly repaired or a, an addition in a bunch of years ago, but it was built in 66 and, and there's, there's certainly a number of, um, issues that need to be resolved in the building. The, the gym has, has floor has swollen up pretty badly. Um, there's a number of playground issues that need to be repaired. So I, I'm not trying to use this as a forum to get pity, but the, I'm just going to make clear that there are a number of other issues that need to be resolved and monitored as we go forward. Um, I'm happy to uh, hear any thoughts or any questions, obviously. And when you eventually see our capital request plan, you know, you're going to see the Crocker Farm gym in there uh, for the next school year because it's, it's, I think we've done as we've, we've lasted as long as we could with some creative work for our facilities department. And I've got some images of the lip um, comes from humidity and it's, it's it, it can't continue in the way it is. Um, so thank you, Mr. Shea. Um, if it's okay, maybe we just, because we're trying to keep these brief, just go all three schools and then see if the committee has questions. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, so thanks for setting a good uh, good tempo there, Mr. Shea, and we'll go to Principal Hernandez for Fort River. So thank you for being here. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, um, my concerns are kind of a mirror, mirror and echo. Um, 
uh, Derek's concerns, you know, with 350 plus students, you know, uh, any day we have, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80 staff members, uh, we're using all the lunch rooms. And now with next year, the Caminantes dual language program growing, um, I'm going to need more classes to, to expand that program. Um, we already have our specialist teachers. Um, this year, I was able to finally get them their own spaces. But um, moving forward, changing, uh, making the, the growing the Caminantes and the dual language program, we're going to have to put them back on carts. And um, there's really no areas in the building. We're really tight on space for storage for all of their equipment. Um, uh, especially with music and technology, they have a lot of, you know, music has a lot of instruments and and things that, that she uses. And then the tech program, of course, has um, all of his technology. Uh, you know, fortunately this year we were able to find space, but m moving forward, they won't have uh, that space um, to, to store their, their items. And then also with the reading, math interventions, um, coaches, counselors, and uh, psychologists, it, we're just fighting for office space or any space where they can um, serve as students. Um, and then we also have our special programs with Bright Program uh, Building Blocks, AIMS, um, and they carry a large amount of staff to make those programs successful. And we have um, anywhere from 15 to 20 staff members, uh, pair of educators in those programs. Um, so just making space uh, is very challenging. Um, currently, our fifth grade is three classrooms. So moving forward, there'll probably be three classrooms. So I'm looking to, I'm going to have to find space to expand dual language and also our fifth grade classroom moving forward um because they have three classrooms themselves uh, they're all in the uh, lunch rooms and the music rooms the old music room um so it does it's a it's very challenging trying to find space so that we can you know provide the services of course that the students needs and this the the specialized programs and in the interventions but also having you know their classroom and their homeroom space um so you know it's it's challenging um I'm gonna to have to get really, really creative and 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 kind of um, merge some things together just to keep everyone housed um, properly and safely. Thank you, Principal Hernandez. And I just want to note that you know when we presented in the spring, we didn't think we could find a space for music and art, and you know the creativity that you brought was greatly appreciated by by the students, but certainly by the staff to be able to identify that space. But there's only so much creativity. Right. There's only so many rabbits you can pull out of a hat. And I think I think you might have pulled the last one this year uh, on that front anyway. So um, appreciate your work on that and your candor. And we'll go to Principal Yaffe at Wildwood. Um, and, and, and you're going to notice these, you know, here's the unfortunate pleasure of going third. And a lot of the themes are quite similar and the challenge are quite similar. But each school has a, a unique um, uniqueness in terms of how they utilize space. So, Nick, um, if you'd yep. like to hear about Wildwood. Sure. And uh, not many kids are playing baseball at Wildwood as well. So I just wanted to give that as the opening. Um, yeah, it's very similar at Wildwood and, and to all the staff, you know, Crocker, Fault River, Wildwood, and a real shout out and their flexibility. Uh, I consider I'm looking at Ben, you know, it's a, it's a minor miracle that Wildwood figured out where to put all the stuff thanks to our facilities um, and clearing out spaces uh, post COVID. So we have 19 classrooms. We also have about 350 children. So some of the Wildwood uh, challenges are, are based. So things can change. So this year, we at the very last minute decided that we could fit in uh, 20, 21 kids into each kindergarten class and, and downsize two kindergartens. So we don't know if that will happen next year, if we'll have two or three. So that's a, that's a caveat. Uh, we also combine the two first, you know, we also downsize in first grade. So we have for the first time two first grades uh, and two co-taught uh, halvesies. So there's plenty of room, but they each have about 21. So we don't know about enrollment, but those two, uh, just having two at those two grade levels really helped us uh, fit everybody in, to be honest. So we have a sixth grade who's in a kindergarten class 
Uh, it enabled us to uh, open up not one, but two cafeterias. So one is being used for instrumental music. And now we're gonna explore using the other uh, for at least a chunk of the day for art classes, because it's art on a card is really tough. Anything on a card is tough, particularly music and art. Uh, so storage is an issue as well. Um, when you, the last thing I'll say is like, when we made Havsies, which are glorious spaces, there are all these other people, as Michelle was saying, who don't have lost their spaces. So that include ELL, intervention, um, <clears throat> especially. So they are in a, ELLs in a combination of different offices and interventions in two different spaces. So again, a shout out to the staff who've shown incredible flexibility. Um, and if the question came down to asking the three of us, can we make it work? I, I'm looking at my colleagues, I think, and Mike, you know, I think we'd say yes and, I guess, you know. Uh, if I can just throw in my own pitch, it's really important to me as someone who's been involved in the Amherst Public Schools that the sixth grade transition is done well and that people really have the time to plan it. Because I, I, as someone who's lived in Amherst 30 years and worked in Amherst, this is a big, big move. So kudos to all of you for, for making it. So that's my plug. I'm done talking, Mike. <laughs> Thank you very much to, to all three of you. And I think uh, just two or three additional comments and we can open up for questions for, for this team. Um, and they can either choose to watch baseball or not please watch baseball, that I'll, I'll leave it to them. But um, I think uh, Nick's right. And I think something that was reflected in everyone's comments is just a, a real appreciation for staff for their, you know, it, it's an era where flexibility is being asked in, in ways that it never was before. And this is an additional element um, that's, that's not true in Pelham at the middle school and the high school where there are certainly the same COVID related challenges, but it's not the same degree of space needs at the other sites. And it's an additional stressor for our staff members, certainly an additional stressor for the, the three folks on the call um, to, to really balance that because when they have staff saying, oh, I need this space at this time, it's, you know, it, it's sort of like sign up sheet and on Tuesdays that'll work, on Thursdays that doesn't and the logistics of just day to day running school uh, are, are, have gotten much more challenging. And that has implications for everyone, for students, for staff. Um, so I, I wanted to note and appreciate not just the three of you, but also for the staff members for their degree of flexibility, understanding the situation. I think the second thing I wanted to share is um, that we're still having a successful year, right? There's this balance of, you know, things are hard and, you know, we see, we see students learning. Um, and some of that's really going back to the facilities department and thanking them for right when COVID hit in the spring, thinking of a plan while imperfect uh, would provide a space where ventilation uh, could happen at a degree to which that we wanted it to happen, um, right? If we waited for a year and hadn't made the changes, particularly to Fort River and Wildwood, you know, we don't know what the ventilation would be. We know it would be suboptimal. Um, you know, the fact that we've had across all, all districts over 20 cases of COVID uh, since last winter, and we've had no evidence of school-based spread that's a testament to the, the how much ventilation matters. And, you know, I think one thing that I continued not to, I could go on about this and I won't, but is that, oh, why didn't you do this years ago? Well, we didn't do it years ago because our population was larger and we couldn't fit the kids then. We can barely fit them now, um, but we couldn't have done it when we had 300 more kids in our district. So I know that's something I've gotten a lot in the last year or so, like, oh, this is just an easy fix. It wasn't, A, it wasn't an easy fix. It wasn't easy to do and B, the implications are what you just heard about, and this is with the lowest population of students that we've had in 20 years. So um, I just had to get that out there so that if people ask you all, you'll, or if people are watching, they'll have an answer to that question. And I think lastly, um, this is why part of the reason we're having the conversation is this is not a sustainable model. What we're doing now is not sustainable. Can we sustain it for another year? We believe we can. Is it something that we feel like can go on another year, you know, collectively in our opinion? It's not that, you know, the, even the prospect of waiting to 2024 is not something that, that we would advocate for. Um, you know, frankly, it's something that we would have a, a really hard time accepting because there are implications for staff and students in the current environment uh, as it stands now. So that's my three uh, kind of summary points. But uh, before we let these folks go, if there's any questions about um, any of the sites or any of the implications while, you, while the principals are on the phone, I thought I'd uh, 
open it up for any commentary from the committee. Mr. Demling. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you all for coming and, and thank you for your, for your service. It's, it's really great to see our principals. And um, I mean, the fact that you've gone through the space issues that we were just described, in addition to bringing everybody back to in-person in the middle of the pandemic is, is quite admirable. So, uh, so thank you. And uh, I, I just love seeing you guys at the, uh, at the school committee meetings. Um, so, so my question is, um, is, is there anything that we could do in terms of investments for the next um, you know, almost you know, year and a half um, ish that that you're you're going to be dealing with this situation, that that based on your experience so far, you think would 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 help mitigate some of this. I know I know we can't buy space um, with with short money, right? But but we do have um, you know this this federal stimulus aid that came in several months ago. It's uh, where that it's you know it's it's medium money, <laughs> right? And and we're using it specifically to address issues. Uh, that have arisen because of the pandemic, and this is certainly one of them. Um, so, you know, you don't have to answer right now if you want to think about it and, and get back. But you know, we we have this bucket of money that we are overseeing that is specifically about addressing COVID-related issues. So, if there's if there's things that you can think of now or later, um, I, I think we would be very interested in, in hearing about that and discussing it. Feels like a uh, topic for a future agenda topic. <laughs> I'm, but I will I will second that that ask because um, it's uh, I, I I do think that that's a question because even um, the vote in front of us is is not or the mo proposed motion would not solve the the space challenges for next year so we will still need to address that um, separately. Miss Spitzer, did you have a? It was a couple of hands up, Miss McDonald. I think some of the principals were looking to. Um, oh, okay offer their initial thoughts on that or um so uh, while they're here if that's okay to allow that yeah yeah um i see uh, mr yaffe uh great thought peter i, I completely agree and and we can set aside some time and brainstorm I, i'd like to expand our thinking a little bit in terms of uh teacher staff well-being as well you know that this is a really stressful time and uh, I had a third grader say to me, were you around in 1970? And uh, what he was referring to is, is the plaque that says Wildwood was built in 1970, which uh, I said I was around, but I was in high school. Um, anyway, I digress, but you know, the, just this whole idea of like, okay, what we know Wild, hopefully we can say all together, Wildwood and Fort River are not gonna last forever. Uh, will not be here for very much long, you know, whatever the timeline is. And are there things that we can do in our schools that just increase, you know, a sense of like pride or, or things are looking good or little things that will just increase the well-being of teachers and, and uh, staff and children? That, that I just want to expand what we're our brainstorming. Mr. Shea, did you want to jump in too? I thought I saw your hand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Peter's on to something. I, I think one of the things that our staff have been fabulous about is, is that, and, and I, I couldn't really come up with the, the proper word here, but there's this notion of sort of like portability or, 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 or just, there's a number of teachers who have to just be constantly moving around from place to place, right? And so I, a great example last week was when, when um, some of our younger students were doing their, their beginning of the year assessments that are, our RTI teachers were kind of out in the hallways with their tables and their desks doing the, doing the work, right? It was the best spot they could find. So I think anything, uh, Peter or Mr. Demley, that falls into that sort of category of like making people, people feel comfortable because they're going to have to be portable. That's part of this whole whole deal. Um, and I think the other thing that I think is really important, and I know Mike's been working very hard on this and, and I think Ben's on the call, Ben's on another, has another role, if that's okay to talk about Mr. Harrington's other role, is that things that make make it work for staff in, in the mornings are, are like, you know, do the, do the windows work, right? Do they open, do they close properly? Do, are the chillers coming on and off at the right times and, and working properly? There's some basic sort of functional things that are really important for people on a daily basis. Just like when you're coming to your home at night, right? If, if, if this time of the year when it's maybe think, time to turn the heating on, you just want things to, to work in an in orderly fashion. And I think, you know, Rupert and, and Ben and Mike have put a lot of time and effort into that. And, and that goes a long way for people. Um, for, for, for things to be functioning well. 
Yeah, and I think um, I, I think Miss McDonald's idea is a good one. You know, I think um, maybe getting a little distance from this vote, but not too much distance. Um, we will be thinking about next year budgetarily, and, and maybe if we put the um, put this on the agenda, give us you know collectively a little time to think about it. Um, maybe come back in December and have a conversation about what what are the ways that we could make the next school year the best school year possible given the conditions that we have. Um, you know, if that'd be amenable to the committee, I, I think that gives our team enough time to come back to it, have some thoughts, get some technical expertise from facilities folks, um, maybe some tech support from, you know, from Jerry Champagne, just thinking about different ways we could provide it. And I think we could probably come up with um, some things that would really make a difference for the kind of for the next school year. Ms. Spitzer. Thank you. Um, and, and I'll try to be brief, but I just wanted to also raise, I, and while well, the principals are on the call, this concern of mine that also once we make this shift to bring sixth grade to the middle school, we're not going to solve all of the space issues either. I mean, not, um, the fact is at Fort River and Wildwood, we, because we moved over to the half stage, I think we've lost more classrooms than we're actually going to gain back. So I don't want the like this, this isn't going to be a silver bullet um, and hopefully, you know, with the school building project on the road. But I think it makes uh, Mr. Dumbling's comment even more important is that it's not just the next year we need to be thinking about. It's the years between now and when we potentially have a new building. So I think it really is important. So thanks, everybody. Totally, um, that, totally agree. And that was where um, sort of my head was going and where I think it could be a really meaty um, conversation um, about how we can use some of these um, stimulus funds to sort of set us on a good track for the next several years until we have a new building because um, yeah it, it, there's only you mentioned three sixth grades that's that's only three classrooms but there's there's um, more than just three three groups needing space it's, it's from the sounds of it so what are some of the other um, things that we can do? Um, so back to the the topic. Oh, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, no, I was going to try to move us on to talking about the the decision at hand as well, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, yeah, I was kind of kind of going to ask a leading question towards helping me kind of decide, but I, I, I was kind of wondering like like what what you all think in terms of like like I know each. School kind of has its own personality, and like each of the grades kind of contribute to that. I'm, I'm just wondering, like, what, how much of a difference will moving the uh, the sixth grade out of your school make to like your your school culture? Like, you guys each have your own like family, basically, and like that's your it's one group is going off to college, so to speak, right? Like, you're like, what what kind of ways have you have, do you guys anticipate? Your school is changing next year. That's kind of very important to me right now. Well, I can start as a former sixth grade teacher just to get the ball rolling. Um, is um, I think I think your question's a good one. That there are certain traditions in our school that sixth grade students have um, been a heavy part of. You know, we think of graduation. Even thinking about that for the year after, where you almost have you would have two grades graduating at the same time. Um, you know, we're not doing as much in terms of whole school traditions this year. And perhaps, you know, I've read some of the principal spaces. It's, we're almost going back 18 months to think about, you know, where sixth grade students were perhaps more involved in school-wide activities because of the trying to maintain as best we can some bubbles. Um, so it, it's sort of, you know, oddly enough, um, it, it seems like an okay time because a lot of the kind of Whole school assembly pieces aren't happening in person because we're not gathering large groups together. I'm not trying to minimize your question, Mr. Harrington, or the impact, but you know, I was just thinking back to my time as a sixth grade teacher at Fort River and Principal Hernandez's school, and I could give you six traditions we used to do that I guarantee are not happening right now because they're not consistent with our COVID uh, protocol. So, you know, I think for me, um, I think the, the the concerns or how that need to be addressed are what's the new role of fifth grade students? Um, you know, how do we support sixth grade, you know, fifth to sixth grade students on that transition, especially that first cohort? And then there are certain relationships in our schools. And I think about the kids, but I also think about the adults. Some of the, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade teachers have worked together for many years. And they, you know, in terms of horizontal alignment, they talk all the time. And that's a different model. 
So I think they're really, I want to acknowledge that there is some real loss from a student perspective, but you know, I'm actually thinking more from the adult perspective of folks uh, who have been pretty critical uh, at the elementary level to give that family atmosphere that you described, Mr. Harrington. You know, certainly the principals can jump in, but you know, I go to traditions and routines a lot and they're so disrupted uh, because of uh, COVID that a lot of the kind of extra responsibilities our sixth graders used to take on, you know, are sort of on hiatus because um, of, high, cause of uh, COVID. So it, it's just a, it's an awkward time for that. But Mr. Shea? Um, I love sixth grade. Uh, so listen, I, there's a number of us who work in the building and, and Mr. Harrington knows this. Like, so I've known a large percentage of our sixth graders have been in our school since kindergarten. So I've known them for seven, this is the seventh year. So you get to know kids and their families incredibly well. Like, Hopefully people won't feel insulted when I say this, but I feel like they're, they're our own kids in some way. Like I, I can talk to sixth graders in a way that's very special, right? So it, that happens through a period of just length of years. So what, what we'll lose, the other school will gain because you go to then a school where teachers at the middle school will know kids over three years rather than two years. So it's a little bit of a loss, right? Because you, you, you have this period, but um, it's just it's a long history of, of being in one building and it's a beautiful thing um but fifth graders will rise up and then they'll become the uh anyway i think it's the right thing any other um thoughts i don't um, to mr harrington's question Um, can I, is it okay if I jump in, Michelle? All right. Yeah, I agree with Derek. You know, it's an emotional thing. We've known these kids and we've created traditions. And now there's something about the closure so if, that you want to have with the last class. And, and we've extolled the sixth grade as the leaders of the school. So we would flip that over to the fifth grade. They are the new leaders. Um, and so what traditions would they have? How would they be? supporting the school through community service, giving back, uh, leading by example. So that, that all would go to fifth grade. And I would imagine having the extra time would then allow the sixth grade team to work with the fifth grade team to share ideas, things like that. I mean, it's a loss of staff. That's the other part that's emotional too. It's like, these are, these are people that you, we have worked with for a number of years or have worked with people in our school for a number of years. Um, and there's a, you know, an aspect where sixth graders have become adolescents. So this is the part where there have been years, I think for all of us, and I'm sure Michelle and her previous schools, you know, where we felt like these adolescents need something that we can't give them because we don't have that area of expertise of staffing. And that, that can be like any given year, to be honest with you, <laughs> some sixth grade groups need it more than others. So. Um, but we'll miss them for sure. I, I know that um, uh, some of the implementation, well, all of the implementation work will, will happen pending and after a decision to make the move. But I'm just wondering if there's um, any any insight or thoughts on that you can share about sort of what that might look like in terms of um, so in the scenario that Amherst is the only district that sends sixth grade to the middle school, um, they'd still be part of the Amherst school dis elementary school district. So, and I, and I know I'm not asking for an implementation plan right now because that's the work that comes after a decision to make that move. But if, you know, just maybe outline that picture for us um, to answer sort of the, the some of the the concepts that you you all just raised about the staff and the family and the connections um, connections there. How does that work if we have sort of um, you know one grade level in a different building but still part of the district? Yeah, so I'll start uh, that one, and I think um, Nick and I were both principals when Mark's Meadow closed, and we did a major transition. This is not the same, but I think there's an analogous. It feels analogous to me. Nick and I, we've talked a little bit about it, but you know, it was 11 years ago. Um, and I think what worked is that we sort of continually develop plans 
and shared them and, and got feedback over time. Um, you know, I think at that time there was a lot of changes at the central central leadership. So I don't know how you felt, Nick, it's been a long time since we talked about, it's hard to do it live in public, but you know, I felt like as principals, we, you know, sort of took on that role and kept on coming back to how do we support students and how do we port, support staff? I mean, it was something like 30 or 40% of students were in a different school one year than they were the year before. So the scale and the magnitude, I don't want to, I know it wasn't one grade level, but it was, it was huge. Um, and it was school and, and, you know, the school Nick was principal of was, was open one day and then was no longer open. So I think the scale of the change was at least as large and the raw numbers was larger of number of students who were experiencing a change. But I think the thing that we did well, uh, two things that stand out to me, one is that we really involved staff in the planning. Um, so that, you know, that was a, a really explicit mention. It did involve staff transitioning to different schools to support students. We would envision the same thing here. Wouldn't be just like growing middle school staff. We'd want to have our elementary school, sixth grade staff and other staff uh, attached to it. And I think the second thing we did is we, we maintained a focus on uh, asking students what they needed in the transition and then trying to support that. So there was an active engagement of students. And I know Nick did a tremendous amount at Marks Meadow as being the school most directly affected. Uh, at Crocker Farm, we did a lot. And we had multiple opportunities for site visits, for connections. We, we really focused on every student having a familiar face and their new site. Um, you know, and, and I was the bit recipient at Crocker Farm of very few students, but a couple staff members to make sure that those few students had those familiar faces. And I do think looking back, you know, I feel very proud of the work that we did as principals and as staff uh, in that transition. So I think it really is that iterative process of hearing from, there's going to be a decision, you're going to make a decision. Um, and then our job as staff is, how do we figure out what student and staff members need to make that transition effective? I think what we could do better this time is I don't, I don't know if our family communication was, we knocked it out of the park on that one. Like when I think about things that went well and things that we would do differently, that's one that I certainly uh, think about. And, and I think we could do better than we did that last time. But um, I think when you talk directly to the people most directly involved, you end up with much better outcomes. And, and for me, we want to mimic, I think, the, the, the successful strategies. I don't want to pick on Nick, but Nick, you were obviously integrally involved in that transition. I don't know if that meshes with your experience and, and transfers over to this one. Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly, Mike. Um, I think um, just one of the things that I remember, besides all, there was all this work at Mark's Meadow to say goodbye. You know, I don't, I don't quite think of this in the same way. You know, because it's more like where are they going to, which we did a lot of. So that's the part I would want to focus on. You know, certainly saying goodbye, Nick, if it's the vote comes to the fifth and, and sixth graders. But there was a lot of work. At Wildwood, we had over 200 new students. It was more than, it was almost half the school. You know, it was like a lot of kids um, and a lot of new staff. So there was a lot of work that we did and created a vision for a school that it, that it did involve children, somewhat families, which I, as I agree with Mike, could do better. But to me, that's the exciting part of this possibility is that students, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade staff, Diego and his team, you know, could create this vision for what a six, and that's the work over the next year plus. That's exciting to me. That was exciting to me at Wildwood, to be honest with you, just to meet all these people that I never knew <laughs> existed and start to work with them. So I think it could be a similar level of excitement and certainly Especially because we're talking about adolescents, you know, involving the six, seven, eighteen kids, you know, be part of that vision. Yeah, and and Derek, I just jump in one second. That um, thank you for saying that, Nick. It really brought me back that we did. So at Crocker Farm, we experienced um, less of a transition than Wildwood and certainly Marks Meadow, as Nick described uh, during that time period. But it did force us in a really positive way to reimagine the school. Like you know, it sort of. You can get into where the school improvement plans look pretty similar year after year and you're working on good work and that's not a critique and sometimes you know you have this external event that forces you uh to be very inclusive in reimagining the school and certainly i i felt that way at crocker farm even with the you know the less degree of change than what you experienced nick so thank you for reminding me of that because i think it's, it's a really important point derek 
I'll just say two quick things. One is that um, I, I was a parent of um, students who were at Mark's Meadow. Uh, I had a kindergartner and a second grader at Mark's Meadow and they transitioned um, to um, to Wildwood. And, and I think I've told this story a number of times, you know, I think I asked both my children what was important and, and they had said that as long as Nick's the principal and Bill's the bus driver, everything will be fine. And, and it's a true story. And, and I tell that because if we, if we project forward to another year where we have a group of fifth graders potentially having their last year at Crocker Farm, the, the, the loss for the students and for the parents will be that the sixth grade year, they would be thinking that if they were still at Crocker Farm, their students going to be known by lots and lots of people and, 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 and a principal who's known them for a period of time. So it's, I think it's really important that, that we, that, and Mike may have alluded to this a minute ago, that whatever happens as we go forward, that those groups of fifth grade students who are leaving to go to the sixth graders, there should be a number of faces and people that they know, and, and so that they're a known entity when you walk into a building. Because that's very important, I think, for parents. I think it's very important for kids, right? That there's, there's staff members that you know uh, and, and have some sort of history with you. Um, and that worked when, when the Marks Medal at Wildwood thing, yeah, certainly for, for more and kids. Thank you for that. That was some um, that's helpful for a, a helpful example. I, I, I was not familiar with the, the work that went in when, at that time. So I think that's helpful to sort of be able to imagine and envision what that might look like. Um, any other uh, comments, questions for our guests? Um, any um, discussion um, on on sort of the, the any further discussion? I think I, d I do want to just sort of add. Um, Dr. Morris mentioned and um, made mention a little bit of the participation that we had in the in the forum um, a couple weeks ago, which was um, robust in comparison to the first one. I also want to remind folks that we we've heard a lot from from the community in addition to those two forums. Um, I, I just counted it up. I think we had over 50 um, uh, public comment messages um, in the last one, um, just in that one meeting, and then countless other emails that we've been receiving, not as public comment. So um, in addition to the survey and, and the public forum. So I really appreciate, I think, um, I, I, I won't speak for the others in the committee, but we've read every single, I've read every single one of those, and I found sort of the the experiences that have been shared and the feedback that's been shared to be really, really helpful, um, particularly in terms of the questions that we've been asked along the way. Um, a lot of those questions are questions that relate to implementation, which will be sort of the next step. Um, but I just want to call out, we've heard a lot from the community. Dr. Morris? So I just want to, you know, Derek, Nick and Michelle, you're welcome to stay, but that's a kind way of saying if you have other things that you'd like to do, you're welcome to do those other things. Um, yeah, baseball, whatever it is that uh, is your fancy. Um, oh, seems like a game to get in the playoffs. I, I won't go into my baseball, um, so I'll leave it there, get myself in trouble. Um, but um, no, but thank you all for being here and thanks for your contributions to the conversation. I just want to point out Michelle has done a tremendous amount in her first couple months on the position and she's a huge add to our team. So. Uh, I know tonight's conversation was going back in time and talking a lot of history, which Michelle has only heard about but didn't experience firsthand. Um, but she, uh, in our meetings, always has ideas to share. And it's really the benefit of having folks come from outside the district with other experiences and other thoughts. Um, they make, she makes um, us better. So I just want to thank Michelle for your contributions as well. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and if you choose to stay, you're welcome, but otherwise have a good evening. Um, but I want to more formally uh, make you know, my recommendation with with a bit of rationale. And I, I, it's nothing new, so I'm not I don't I'm not going to go on uh, long winded about it. But you know the reason I'm making the recommendation I am is again threefold um, that we have an opportunity as part of the building project uh, to take care of both Wildwood and Fort River School within the next five years. Uh, both of those schools desperately need to be taken care of. That the, 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 the stakes of not resolving both of those buildings issues are incredibly high and going into the 2030s is it, to me unimaginable, you know, um, I mean, 
it's hard to be me and not me, right? So I was like in 2013 when the MSBA got in and the then superintendent asked me to be, you know, on the building committee. So I've, I've been in this game a while. Um, I don't want to be in it till 2031, right? It's just the buildings won't make it. I might make it, we'll see, but the buildings definitely won't in terms of the challenges that, um, that'll happen. So for me, you know, the MSBA making a binary choice or creating a binary scenario where either we choose for the sixth grade to go or we only address one building, um, you know, really contributes to my thinking about this. Um, the second thought is really reflected in the last half hour in the conversation you heard from the elementary principals. We have a space conundrum that COVID created that is not sustainable. Um, and it would actually get worse if we just went the K to six Fort River because that's only 320 students. I don't know where we put the other students at Fort River who need to go somewhere given the condition of Wildwood other than requading it. And sort of the idea of putting quads back up at Wildwood, you know, is, is not something I can really imagine happening either. Um, you know, so that's really my second reason. The third reason this gets to the 2023 is I believe we can do this well. I believe this can actually contribute to a revitalization of the middle school. And it's no critique of the middle school right now. Um, but I've heard from middle school teachers for years and years and years of the challenges of having a two year school um, and how that sort of the kids are either coming or going and it doesn't allow for that sustained level of, of knowledge of students work with students uh, knowledge and working with families and that familiarity that we want for our students, whatever grade level they're at. We want that at the high school too, right? And we have a four year high school and part of that's for that reason, right? The middle school used to be a three year, it used to be a seven, eight, nine uh, middle school. So it had that three year span and then has gone down to two years. I think our middle school staff do a fabulous job of making the best of a awkward situation. You know, the combination of where students are developmentally at that age level uh, as well as having a two year span, right? The structures define experience. And we've created structures in our schools that really change people's experience and not always for the better, in my opinion, uh, of having that sustained, sustained knowledge. It's, it's the point of time in students' lives where they probably or arguably need the most connections and the most stability. And we have students change schools two times in three years. You know, you wouldn't draw it up that way if you were drawing up schools. So uh, for me, I, you know, we have a lot of successful models. I was on the phone with a superintendent around here, similar demographic district, just this afternoon talking to them, what do they do in their six to eight middle school? How do they make it work? How kind of separate it? So it's not that we're creating this model that doesn't exist. Uh, we actually are operating a very rarely used model. And I think there's a lot of great models out there that we can do to enhance the experience and provide more elective opportunities for our sixth grade students um, and to really come back, you know, and support them. And I, I go back to uh, Mr. Demling was at this meeting, I think. So a couple of years ago, the commissioner came when he was first um, hired and we were at Fort River School and he was doing his tour of, um, you know, all the school or many of the schools across the Commonwealth. And we were at Fort River, we walked in a sixth grade classroom I think it was Mr. Austin's classroom and the students had their index cards of questions for the commissioner. And the first two questions they asked are, why don't our rooms have walls? And why are we in elementary school? And that's what our sixth grade students were telling us in prepared questions. And in response, Commissioner Riley, I think rightfully said, well, you know, that's a question for your school committee members. And it was Mr. Demling and Mr. Donas, I think at that point, who were sitting with me and the students all turned to us and we didn't have great answers for them. Um, and, and for me, we have this opportunity actually to address the building needs that our students have experienced for generations and generations of students in our buildings, uh, and also to address some larger concerns about where students are developmentally and to build a program that's developmentally appropriate. Uh, my personal bias, and I think it's, I'm hearing it a lot from community members and staff members, is not to mimic the middle school experience for sixth grade or current one, but really to develop a, a unique sixth grade experience that understands where they are developmentally and supports them in that transition to the middle grade levels. So, you know, for those reasons, it's my recommendation. I'm so glad that, you know, you all asked the questions you did of, Ms., of the principals and myself about that there is loss in this. Uh, I don't wanna pretend that this is uh, without challenge. I don't wanna pretend this isn't, is without work and planning or without real loss. I was a former sixth grade teacher. You talked to me 20 years ago, I probably have a, you know, different perspective on this because uh, I love that role but as one of my former colleagues said it's not 2020 or it's not 2000 it's not 2001 uh, our students are operating in a different environment uh, than they were then 
And, and I think we have to adjust and support students along that dimension. So that's why I came with the recommendations that, that I'm making tonight for the motion that's you know, in the packet. Again, if, if the committee goes a different way, we're of course going to make the best of uh, any, you know, whatever decision the committee makes, but I do feel confident we'll be able to make this transition uh, to strengthen the experience of our students and certainly take care of the infrastructure needs that have frankly plagued our district for just about 40, right, 45, 50 years. Since those buildings opened, they've been problematic. And my last little uh, narrative that I'd like to share other than the Fort River one is, uh, so I started teaching, I was an intern at, at Fort River in the year 2000. And I remember thinking, this is a wacky school, right? Well, there's half walls, right? I, the infrastructure of the school is really, really funny. And uh, I remember being at lunch in, the, in the, the old staff lunchroom and asking someone like, why did they build this school this way? And the staff member, veteran staff member said, oh, they didn't build one school this way. They built two schools this way. You should go to Wildwood. It's like the same, except it was built a couple years before. And they told stories of being at Wildwood uh, in the early years and how immediately staff struggled to work with the open you know, classrooms, the other challenges that existed and so I'd like 50 years from now for folks to talk about this decision and say, oh, they got it right. Yes, our schools need to be updated because 50 years is a lifespan, but these schools were durable. They were green. You know, they, they, um, they were energy efficient and they promoted learning, right? So for me, it's this really opportunity I don't take lightly and that's why I'm expanding on it. Again, I apologize for the length of my comments, but this doesn't come around very often, the opportunity to really reshape the learning environment for kids for, for multiple generations. And I think we have it. And I think not taking advantage of it at the moment in time for me would be, um, I'm not sure how we'd feel looking back um, down the road at this opportunity we have. So I will stop talking now, I apologize, but I, I thought it was just worthwhile because we've heard a lot of public comments and I know I've done a lot of presenting, but just to be more clear on my own viewpoint on the matter. Thank you. Any discussion, comments? Um, Ms. Spitzer. You're muted. I also would like to take a little bit of time to kind of give the reasoning behind my vote, just because I know um, for all the reasons Dr. Morris just stated, this is an important decision. I, don't want to come off as taking lightly. And so, and, and since we've been going back so much historically, oh, <laughs> you know, I have an aunt who was in that, you know, for building back in the 1970s. And, you know, I attended Crocker Farm in, in a quad, and I also was at the middle school. Um, not in a quad, I'm sorry, in, in like a trailer. And, and same thing when I was at the middle school. So I think over time, our district has faced a lot of challenges infrastructure wise, some due to over enrollment back in the 90s. And now I think some of the challenges we're facing are, you know, based on things we couldn't have predicted, like the pandemic. But I think what we do know is that we need to do something. And it, it, I'm similarly, you know, joined the school committee um, in large part um, because I was, uh, you know, really, <laughs> really distraught by the fact that our, our buildings are in the state that they are in. And I think it's imperative that we do something. Um, that being said, I, I I don't think I would make this decision um, to 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 make this change if I didn't think that it would also be appropriate for our students, you know, in terms of their learning or social emotional needs. You know, I I believe strongly that buildings matter. I believe space matters, and especially for our staff, the people who work in these buildings. You know, not just for a few years, but potentially for their entire careers. We owe it to our staff. We owe it to our students, and we owe it to um, the families who will hopefully one day again be, you know, going into our buildings um, again on a regular basis. So um, I want to look at this vote as an opportunity to really think and be creative about the, you know, the, there are a lot of challenges, but I think there are a lot of opportunities. I'm so excited about the thought that maybe sixth graders might have access to language um, earlier, that sixth graders might have access to sports in a different way than they do now, or potentially theater. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that happen um, in the middle school and high school that um, I think our sixth graders might be able to, to, to access. Now that comes with challenges with younger kids mixing with older kids, but I, I do have confidence in our teachers and administrators to, to, to take the time 
plan this out and it, I'm sure it's going to be iterative. I don't think we're going to get it right off the bat. Um, but um, I guess the only thing I want to, you know, say is I think I'm the only one right now who's got, got kids um, who might potentially be actually directly impacted by this. And, and, you know, I actually have my child, my oldest will be in that group. That's kind of in the in between. He's going to be a fifth grader next year. He's going to miss out on that chance to be the oldest in the classroom um, or in the school building. So I think it's really important that we engage with those families, engage with those students and find a way so that they don't, you know, maybe they'll feel special in a new way, you know, rather than um, uh, not being able to experience being the oldest until, you know, later on in their middle school or high school careers. So um, I want to say thanks to everybody who's provided all the feedback, especially the principals and staff who have been um, available to us as we consider this decision. So thank you, everybody. Mr. Demo. Yeah, um, so I'll just plus one on thanking everybody for their input. I, I think uh, it's been a, a multi-year process, as, as we've said um, before, but I, I think for me, particularly intensive in the last 10 months, um, I think it was last December, um, if I'm not mistaken, that we heard the MSBA decision on on the on what was available, and so it became clear that day that um, if we're going to take care of Fort River and Wildwood, that that something had to happen, um, and and this is what used to happen. So I won't go over all the the points that Dr. Morris has has stated very well, um, uh, but yeah, I'm I am comfortable voting for this. Uh, tonight to move sixth grade to the middle school for the fall of 23 uh, for, for for all the reasons that, that have, uh, have been stated. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful that this isn't something that we have to do, that we're being forced to do, um, like kind of biting our, 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 our um, holding our nose on, right? I, I think if, if six to, if a three-year middle school was, was uncommon, and there weren't examples of how to do it successfully, and there weren't other benefits for students, but we had to do it because Fort River and Wildwood Building Project demanded it. We we might still be doing it, but it would be very difficult. I think it would be a much more um, fraught decision. Um, but but the fact that we know that we can do it responsibly um, is is what sort of pushes it over the edge for me. But but that you know, and, and that's the key is is doing it responsibly. And we've already talked earlier about a number of these. Uh, items of, of well, what does that mean to, to do it responsibly? It means not forgetting about the the, the space crunch at Fort River and Wildwood and Crocker um, for the next couple of years, um, and so you know prioritizing that. So I'm, I was really happy to hear you know us having support for that and bringing that back um, this year. Um, it's also what Ms. Ms. McDonald um, mentioned. I think is really important is that Fort River and Wildwood are going to be around even in a best case scenario for another five years. Um, that's a long time to keep those buildings up, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, you know, so that those are going to need some attention. And so, um, you know, we're going to have to keep, keep thinking about that. And then, you know, in addition to having a, a having time to plan the model, there, there's the idea of the transitioning cohort that the first adopter students, um, and, and wanting to make sure that, that we support them. You know, we got a lot of feedback from fifth grade parents, uh, understandably so about, um, concern about moving, doing this move next next um, fall, but now, now it falls to the fourth graders, right? And so, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna wanna hear from, from those, those students and those parents, and what can we do for those students specifically that are doing this transition for the very first time? Um, uh, like, like Dr. Morris was mentioning uh, earlier when, when we were talking about uh, um, Mark's Meadow. So yeah, I, I won't go on too much longer because we've had a lot of these discussions I feel already. I guess the last thing I, I would really want to say is I'm feeling pretty excited for the opportunity. Um, I, I know that there has been a lot of anxiety expressed about the transition and naturally so. I had three kids that went from being young kids to adolescents. Um, and so, you know, I get that and that is very valid. Um, but I was I was lucky enough to be a middle school parent, an arms middle school parent for six years in a row, just because the way my kids are aged. Um, and it's a special place. Um, uh, and it's and it's largely due to the amazing people there. Some of the best teachers in our district teach at the at Amherst Pelham Regional Middle School, um, like life changing teachers, uh, amazing teachers who know 
how to teach and reach kids of that age, you know, in a, in a way that, that is, is unbelievable in a, in a totally inspiring way. And so to have an opportunity to, to take something that already has great bones and, and great staff uh, and enhance it and, and think about ways that, you know, not only the sixth graders could benefit from the seventh and eighth, but, but vice versa. And, and how do we take this as an opportunity to, um, to take what's already there and build on it? I, I think it's pretty exciting. And I, th I think, um, uh, you know, having staff totally involved in, in the, um, uh, the model planning process is, is essential and having community members involved in that process. And I think they'll be really enthusiastic and engaged. So um, I'm, I'm glad this isn't just something that we have to do because of the MSBA project. I'm actually also enthusiastic and, and, and happy to vote in support of this night. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not entirely sure of like what my what my opinion would be, like how different it would be had I not worked in an elementary school and then recently, relatively recently transitioned into the Amherst Regional Middle School building. Like the, the one thing that I've thought about a lot, and I didn't I've thought about every last detail you could think about was like there was the Duke study where they kind of broke down these the differences in transitional years, right? That that you know. So the, the, your disciplinary issues happen in that first transitional year, right? And then you spend the next year leveling out, basically, right? So the more I think about having like that that 12-year-old, 12, 12, 13-year-old point in your life be a little more stable and you not having, there's there's all these things in your life that are changing at that point, right? And so having that that one year to settle out, I think that from from what I've read anyway, seems to be like very impactful. And from, from what I've seen, I, I kind of feel like it's it's necessary. Like I, you know, I kind of echo what everyone else says about the the middle school and the folks that that make that make up that staff. And the, you know, I probably alluded to it with my question earlier. Like and thinking thinking about how this impacts our like our sixth grade educators, right? We have some amazing sixth grade educators that like, you know, they 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 kind of act as launching pads. Well, here they get to they don't have to worry about being a launching pad so much as like a welcoming kind of kind of a being at, at any school or whatever and so i think i'm a lot more comfortable than i was initially especially based on you know public feedback and data I mean, put those two things together and i think we can make like the right decision tonight i won't um you all have expressed sort of nuance um, aspects of sort of what i think i would plus one probably every one of what you all have said um and, and I think, but um, for me, one of the things that I, I really think about is that um, it, I don't, I'm not sure it would feel as good um, to Mr. Demling's point about if we were making this decision solely because we needed to from a space perspective. It feels like, um, you know, the, the building um, infrastructure is driving um, the, the the humans inside as opposed to the other way around and I think what I what I, I learned through the my work on the advisory board um, as well as just uh, sort of through you know since that time um, that in many ways we you know we might be making this decision anyway even if we didn't have have that um, that space need so it's it's um, and that, which is why I mentioned at the beginning of this that that work started well before we had we were facing these these significant structural issues. I mean, the buildings themselves we needed to replace, um, but it was even before we knew the MSBA decision that was that was sort of giving us just two choices there. Um, and and I think that's important because um, you know when you when you read through that report and read through the pros and cons and you read through sort of the considerations that um, in particularly with regard to the curriculum and, and social emotional development of the young adolescent, um, th there's a lot. That, you know, it, it, there, there's no right one right answer. Obviously, there's there's districts around the country that that do it that don't do six through eight, um, but there's a there's enough in there that says that it it it, it can be a really positive um, experience and supportive experience for the young adolescent to have this grade six through eight, um, even if we didn't have all these other issues that that were that have piled on since um, since that that working group or advisory board. Um, so for me, I support that. 
I, I also really appreciate the, the um, proposal to the recommendation to delay um, to the fall of 2023. Um, the, you know, we, we know that we have phenomenal educators and staff, um, both at the middle school and in our elementary schools. And I think um, unlocking their ability and enabling them to collaborate for um, a full year on, on working through what that will look like in that implementation plan, as well as the transition for our students and families, I think can make it a really positive experience as opposed to only um, a disruption um, and only, you know, focusing on all the, the challenges and changes. Um, so I, I would support the, the recommendation as well. Are there any closing thoughts before we move to the motion? Dr. Morris? I just wanted to make a process statement for, you all may know this, but um, for people watching too, is this vote would also require, if it's affirmative, would, would be taken up at the regional level as well. Uh, we've had, um, I wouldn't say casual, we've had very real conversations at the regional level about people's willingness who are the uh, Amherst, non-Amherst reps in the region about leaving the door open for if any towns wanted to participate. I also wanted to note that Leverett wasn't able to have me go last night, but I'm scheduled later this month uh, for their elementary school committee We've talked about it a bit at Pelham. So I think that context just matters for people who are watching that um, this vote needs to be followed up with a vote at the regional level. Um, and then there'll have to be a lot of collaboration communication between um, the districts between them. So I don't wanna delay your vote, but I think just for people watching to have the, the organization, the, the context for um, the, an elementary school committee, in this case, the Amherst School Committee would need to vote to do this, we'd also need a vote of the region to allow for students um, from uh, one or more of the member towns to um, occupy space in their building. So I just thought it was important to note. Yes, yeah, it's it's a it's it's a complicated decision and move on in many many levels. Um, with that, then I will I will um, start. I will make the motion that um, I move to have sixth grade students in the Amherst Public Schools attend school at the Amherst Regional Middle School starting in the 2023-2024 school year, pending the approval of a similar motion from the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Spitzer. And we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. And as mentioned, the next uh, step is that uh, the regional school committee at its next meeting, which is next Tuesday, October 12th, um, will take this up um, and have a similar discussion about adding sixth grade. Next up, we have a update on the school elementary school building project. Yep, and I can start. Mr. Harrington, as your rep, can can jump in if you'd like, and uh, or with what I missed. So. We had eight. Um, we have eight design firms who have applied for the role of architect for the building project. That's a good, healthy number. Um, we had a meeting, I think, two weeks ago, Mr. Harrington, um, where we went over in detail um, each of the eight applications, um, which are pretty thick. So it was a robust conversation, um, strengths and, and potential challenges. We had a green consultant. Uh, who our owner project manager had on board to help us understand the technical parts of uh, her, her opinion of the capacity to build the net zero building or to work with net zero concepts. Uh, I don't know, you, Mr. Harrington, you're more knowledgeable than me. I found her role very, very helpful because I can read and everyone looks like they have the same skills to be able to do that. And the reality is that that's not the case. So she was helpful in interpreting some of the more technical aspects. Um, but I, I thought we heard from a lot of different committee members um, uh, different opinions. We're meeting again Thursday morning, so two days from now at eight o'clock. It's a public meeting to finish that conversation and perhaps uh, allow the committee to offer specific feedbacks about um, ranking them. Um, and then on November 2nd, which is election day, 
Mr. Harrington, myself, and uh, Ms. Shane, who's the um, chair of the building committee and town councilor. We will be at the MSBA designer selection panel, and the goal of that meeting will be to shortlist, which is uh, we have eight applicants and, and choose who to interview. We're not, we don't, we're not, we wouldn't interview all eight of them. Um, so we'll be able to share uh, that. And the process is that each of the three of us individually have three individual votes, and then the rest of the votes, which is usually in the na neighborhood of 12, I may be off by one or two, uh, goes to different members of the MSBA's designer selection panel who work for the MSBA. Uh, but our voices contribute to that, both by vote and by voice, um, you know, by communicating uh, our personal opinion as well as what we heard from the committee. Uh, roughly two weeks after that, uh, we will be interviewing the candidates who are shortlisted and at that meeting making a decision of who the preferred candidate will be. Um, all those meetings are MSBA meetings are virtual. They're all open to the public, so anyone can tune in and watch if they so choose to do that. And it's a really exciting, this is for me where uh, the sort of slog part of the MSBA process kind of tails off and it gets very exciting very quickly with uh, working with an architect, engaging the community, coming up with models, even if they're initial, it, it, you know, that's a pretty exciting piece. Some of the procurement stuff is, uh, maybe some people like it, but it's, I think for the public, it's less engaging than you know the actual work. So we have had participation, public participation in our meetings. We do have, I think every meeting we've had some folks uh, on there, we have had public comment, but I think um, for the majority of folks, they're interested in what's the building gonna look like and where's it gonna be and, and those kind of questions. And that's, we can't get there until we get an architect on board. So uh, we are uh, moving full steam ahead on that with lots of good feedback. And I think that's, uh, summary of where we are, but I want to turn to Mr. Harrington, see if I missed or uh, what I missed. No, that, yeah, that was, that was spot on. I just wanted to, to double down on the, uh, I guess the volume of material we have to read through for, for these designers, but, but no, no there, there were some very impressive entries. And, and also, I just wanted to double down on the, the green building expert that they brought in from Answer. Like she was very much on point and I appreciate it. So how many, um, how many firms, maybe you said this, but how many firms will be shortlisted of the eight? Um, that'll be up to the designer selection panel, but my experience is that it's generally three. Um, but that, you know, that's a group vote and decision. But in general, when you look at like the MSBA, like the past projects, it, it typically is three. Yeah, and I think there's no shortage of good ones to choose from, as Mr. Harrington said. I had um, another question about just in general, because uh, I believe one of the tasks of the owner project manager was to um, to set up the, the project website. And I'm just curious if there's been any mo movement on that. Yep, that is actually the other agenda item for Thursday um, is to, they've been working, actually there was a meeting today with uh, Sasha Figueroa and Debbie Westmoreland from our office. I know they've been working with Rihanna over at the town. Uh, Sasha ran a lot of the communication for the last building project. She was a um, ex officio member of that building committee actually uh, at that point. So they tried to hear what went well, what didn't go well. They've got some designs they wanted to share with them. I was uh, rightfully not included in that call because I wouldn't have been a, a helpful contributing member. Uh, but I believe that is on the agenda. I can double check right now, but I believe that's on the, actually I know it's on the agenda for Thursday. Uh, morning's meeting is around communication and website. And I, I believe they they're, they're likely to share a draft of where they're at, or at least some images of, of what it would look like. Because I know there is uh, a lot of um, interest, especially as things will accelerate quickly, uh, being able to communicate that way. So um, I think the, the owner project manager and the chair are on it, and we'll see what it looks like on Thursday. Great. Other questions? Mr. Demling? Yeah, I mean, I just want to thank Dr. Harrington and uh, Dr. Morris for for going through those, I, I've, I've been through a couple of technical interviews like that in, in the past, and I understand what you mean by the material and getting through all that. So, and that's not that's not anything anybody. This is all like behind the scenes stuff. So I I really appreciate you, you doing that. Um, it's really important, you know, not not very visible, but very important work. Um, so yeah, like I I think the the only input I would have maybe for you you all can pass it on to like the building committee is, you know, the sooner that we the people know where to go. Right and know approximately when it it all kicks off, quote unquote. Um, 
the better. I mean, that's really the most general but most common question that I get. Hey, when is this all really kicking off? I don't care about procurement stuff. I don't care about, you know, designers. So like, when does it all kick off and where do I go? Um, you know, so even if, even if it's all set up and ready to go and just, it has a date that like, you know, um, November or December, whatever it is, um, this is when we select the designer and this is when the first public meeting on this is. And um, I think just having that first bit of info is going to be really key for people. So um, I appreciate that you're, that it sounds like the committee is um, moving forward on that. Any other questions? Okay. So the meeting is on Thursday morning. At eight o'clock in the morning, and it's a virtual meeting, and so anyone can log in, and there is a space for public comments, which we're, uh, I, can, I think I speak for the chair, we're very open to, and, you know, we've heard some about daylighting and, you know, some other uh, really helpful uh, public comments so far, so. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so moving on to our next item um, is uh, safety, COVID, safety and health updates um, related to COVID in the schools. Yep. So um, I've got four things to share. One I've already shared, but I'll reshare it because I think it'll be really important is tomorrow night we have a medical experts and medical professionals event at eight o'clock. And it's not just talking about secondary level, it's talking about elementary level uh, items as well, particularly as the uh, ages five through 11 vaccine will at least be considered by the FDA. I think it's the 24th to 26th of this month, but I know it's it's before the end of the month. It's already been scheduled where um, the FDA advisors will be looking at the data and, you know, potentially making a recommendation one way or the other on that vaccine. So they'll be speaking some to that, not that they're the FDA, but they'll they'll talk a bit about that and what they're seeing. Uh, I think the second thing I want to share is, you know, we have had a number of cases this year, um, positive cases in the Amherst Elementary Schools. I think it's also worth noting that we've had no evidence of school-based spread. Uh, we've had, had close contacts. They've been tested. Um, and that's really a testament to the, the systems that um, we've set up and Robin Supernot in the nurses work and Jennifer Brown at the health department. I can't say we'll never have school-based spread, but what I can say is that, you know, to date we haven't had it, that the layered mitigation strategies we've utilized have worked. We've also seen a significant decline across all three districts in the last two weeks compared to the first couple of weeks of school. And, and it's hard to not say that there's significant evidence elsewhere that this is a common trend as community has a lot of cases, schools have cases. As the number of cases in the community decline, the number of cases in schools decline. So we are, we, we do mirror the schools, mirror the schools in terms of the cases. So again, I'll put a plug in for vaccinations and just for talking about it for kids, obviously that was a hot topic last week, um, but it's also about community vaccination rates, community members being safe um, and limiting their unmasked indoor time. That all affects our experience in school schools. Um, I referenced before the call that there's an article from um, Cobb County, Georgia, um, that's getting a lot of attention and, and other places. And a lot of the focus is rightfully on school-based mitigation measures, or frankly, the lack there of them in certain communities. But I think what, what's sort of underemphasized is um, if there's a lot of cases in the community, of course, there's going to be lots of cases in school. And so, you know, really want to thank and appreciate that we live in a community that I think for um, comparatively anyway, you know, does a really good job of individually and collectively focusing on community safety uh, as it relates to COVID. So I'm deeply appreciative. I'm not working in a place and frankly living in a place where the numbers are scattered and super high um, because of lack of effort on a local level uh, around typical safety mitigation strategies that aren't school-based but are community-based. And, and I think, you know, I don't, there's no crystal ball, but I think we're likely to see ebbs and flows. Right. It's just because the cases are down now doesn't mean in two weeks we're not going to see another increase in cases. And so we have to keep up with our mitigation strategies in school because we know the track of the virus is going to be up and down and, you know, hopefully trending down out of a long term downward trend. But it's not to say that, you know, particularly after um, large indoor gatherings that may happen over holidays, other things like that, we may see the impact in school and we really have to you know, maintain our vigilance. The third thing I wanted to share is, uh, we talked about this at the regional level, but all of our vaccinations, um, the deadline of the exclusion date has been pushed back to December 1st. That's true at the elementary level as well. The COVID vaccine obviously isn't uh, available yet at the uh, for, for just about all students at the elementary level. It's also the case that even if it does 
get approval, it'll likely have the emergency authorized use. Um, we won't have the full approval. So, you know, none of the regional policy work would apply very quickly, but we have a number of more uh, longer standing vaccines that students are behind just because of the nature of the pandemic. So we want to give families enough time to get their students to be able to have the vaccines they need. So the vaccine, that deadline's December 1st, not November 1st this year, um, because we understand the situation. Our nurses are working really hard to get that information out to families. The last topic is pool testing. This is an unsurprisingly a sore topic. Um, so today we had um, another change in vendor, which was um, because the, prime, the vendor we were working with, which was our second vendor, was not successfully working out. So we talked to the to Desi, to the head of CIC Health, who's re remarkably responsive to us uh, with concerns, and we are being transitioned to a new vendor. Hopefully this is a more successful approach. We are going to send out consents tomorrow just because we need to get them out. Uh, we are working perhaps on some alternative strategies with CIC Health, the state approved uh, kind of meta vendor, right? The vendor I'm talking about is kind of like on a more micro level or subcontractor. Um, that might get us going a little sooner. Um, they're going to send us some samples. We're going to maybe try some things out this week or next week to see if it's scalable with um, some version of take-home test uh, that students could then drop off either in a drop box at school or if parents are dropping, families are dropping them off, they could drop them off that way. So we are working with CIC Health on sort of every strategy to get going as soon as possible because we know there is a, a strong interest in pooled testing. I think it's also worth noting for staff members who are unvaccinated, we have, uh, through the generosity of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, a, an agreement where they will support us by supplying 150 um, PCR tests. Uh, we pick them up, we distribute them to staff, um, staff distributes them back to us, and we carry them back. So we will have a system for unvaccinated staff members based on the staff vaccination policy uh, to start implementing. We actually have the test now, we just have to work out the systems and uh, on that. So I think starting, you know, certainly by two weeks, I think next week we'll start, probably be able to start in earnest. We're doing some trying out just to see how the systems work and, and the logistics of it. So uh, if pooled testing doesn't happen as quickly as we can, it doesn't get in the way of the policy that the, the school committee passed. It was a regional school committee, but it applied across uh, all three districts. Uh, so I want to publicly thank UMass for um, being willing to support us free of charge, um, which has not gone unnoticed with a significant number of PCR tests, given our current situation. Um, this isn't a knock on CIC or the, the state, but it is just in a way where UMass has been a wonderful partner in trying to support us uh, and really support the school committee in you know, the policy you passed around staff and, and school safety. So I, I wanna publicly acknowledge and thank UMass for, for stepping in. And, and I will tell you that it was as quick as I call in the afternoon saying, anything you can do and by that evening, we had already uh, had a commitment from UMass to support us during this time. And that doesn't happen everywhere. And, you know, it, it's nice having been around this job for a while, not that it always works out, but we have enough built good relationships with individuals uh, who are willing to jump in when we needed them to, when we needed them to. So, you know, thank you to everyone at UMass for doing that and, and working with us on that, um, this project. I think that's my health and safety update for now. I'm happy to take any questions from anyone on the committee. I'll second the appreciation for um, UMass support on this, and um, good to hear that there's also sounds like some flexible, some flexing on the pool testing as well. Ms. Spitzer. So I was also just going to um, first thank Dr. Morris for taking the initiative to reach out to UMass, and then thank thank UMass as well. I think that's huge, and especially given the the challenges we're facing with the pool testing, which I'm disappointed to hear are ongoing. Um, I guess just for the community's benefit, I mean, we're, we're still doing by next testing if it's needed for anybody who's symptomatic. So because we're, the, the pool testing was our asymptomatic testing, but we still have the symptomatic testing up and running, I'm hoping. We do, we have that and the state has given us a, a way to reorder if we run out of by next tests. And so that's been helpful and we've used them. Um, and so I wanna be clear because this comes up um, routinely that the Binex testing we have is for symptomatic individuals who become symptomatic when they're on site. If individuals are symptomatic off site, we ask them not to come to school. They should go to a, that's not our protocol. They should go to a different um, source uh, for symptomatic testing. It's, you know, if they're not on site, but if, if a student or a staff member becomes sick with 
COVID-like symptoms on site than they are that we do have Binax tests available for use uh, with parent consent for students or family consent. Thank you for raising that point. I should have said that. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item, which is um, our budget development process. Um, and, and we had, I, I, I believe that we had some conversation about this at an earlier meeting. Um, what this sort of stems from conversations we've had at other committees um, that began, um, that we started back in August when um, when we joined with that committee. On that, and with that committee, we were on a, um, a retreat um, and wanted to talk about ways, um, uh, ideas to enhance our budget planning, our budget development and planning um, approach. Um, and this stemmed from a couple of things um, that we've experienced, um, particularly um, the, over the summer um, questions um, and requests for more information and more meetings from um, some on the town council, really wanting to dig into and understand more um, about our school's budget. Um, but we also experienced that with um, from the community when we had our um, budget hearings at the end of the cycle last year. Um, so in the packet, so tonight, well, we, there's no decision that we're going to be making necessarily tonight, just to be clear. Um, this is an open um, conversation and discussion about um, ideas that we want to explore implementing um, as we, before we get into the um, budget, deep into the budget development process. So we're taking the time now in early October before we get um, deep into it. Um, Attached to this agenda item is um, probably looks familiar. It's very similar to one that we looked at um, on our other other school committee, um, but it's just a, a, a document that to frame or or start our conversation. It's just a discussion starter. Um, you know, as we were talking about it, is some of the goals that we wanted um, in our budget development process for Amherst Elementary School schools. Um, one we wanted to build greater understanding of our the budget drivers and challenges um, not just within the community but also with our municipal elected officials um, uh, as deriving from the questions um, and and um, legitimate questions that we're getting from um, some on the town council um, but overall um, wanting to achieve greater transparency and community engagement in the budget planning and development so that it's not um, at the very end of the, the budget planning when we get to the budget hearing that we're we're getting input and questions and um, from the community but hearing some of the priorities and 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 desires from the community early on in the process um, so what's listed here are just some of the um, some ideas um, to get us started um, one of which, and then a possible sort of flow of how that might look in, in terms of a timeline. Um, and one of the ideas that we've sort of tossed around um, or considered is having, what, uh, in the town of Amherst with the, new, with the town charter, we're required to have um, a, a, an annual forum open to the community. Um, in past years, we've, we've used, we've sort of made it um, ad hoc depending on sort of topics that we had at hand um, that we wanted community input on and sort of designated those as our charter required community forum. This idea will turn this into maybe a recurring or annual community forum that happens at the beginning of our budget planning cycle and that also serves as um, one of the required charter required community forums. Um, but it would be a way for us to share information um, about the budget, sort of current current um, challenges um, and drivers, answer questions, and hear input from the community on priorities. And we could have it with different stakeholder groups or, or um, simply a, a, a series for everybody to join in. Um, that would be, if, if, if we follow that through, um, probably in the November, December timeframe, um, and I, I see uh, Dr. Slaughter's joined us, so I'm sure he has opinions um, on, on sort of timeline on this one. And maybe he's even 
thought, you know, penciled out a, a rough timeline at this point. I know it's very early in the cycle. Um, and then, uh, you know, some of the other things that we talked about at another committee was creating sort of a budget primer or FAQ to better explain um, budget concepts, including sort of our sources of funds as well as our uses of funds um, and, and just overall governance and process with our budgets. So those are all sort of ideas that I sort of consolidated onto this document for us. Um, and they're all ideas that we've raised over the past, I would say, six months or so. Um, through conversations either with this committee, another committee, or um, in in other conversation. So uh, thoughts. I saw you. I saw you smiling, Dr. Slaughter. I don't know if you wanted to add anything in, in terms of uh, this at this point, or just answer questions as we go along. <laughs> um, thoughts. Mr. Demling. Um, so I like all the ideas on here. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, that being said, one of the challenges is, is that, uh, at least at the Amherst level, is that we're a small committee and um, do we have the capacity to execute on all of this? Um, I would I would like to think that to some first level degree we do, um, but it, it does, it, it is ambitious. Um, I think it's appropriately ambitious. It's ambitious for things that I think we ought to do. Um, but at the at the end of the day, translating this into reality means it ends up on somebody's to do list, right? And so, um, you know, for if, if we're talking about a possible plan where some of these things are happening this month, um, then you know, then the the, the, the uh, distribution of that to do list has to happen pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so I think that's one one challenge for us. Um, but you know, that that practical consideration aside, I I really like the these ideas. I I think. Um, I think there is is more that we can do for forums. I, th I think forums are are something that we might not get exactly right in terms of the format and and, and the structure immediately, because I think sometimes they're hard to do um, in terms of scoping it appropriately and providing enough information for people to react to. Like for example, I, I do. It is true that I do want to hear from anybody, generally speaking, about what they value in the schools and what we should be investing in. But that seems like a very generalized idea of just tell us how you're doing. And um, if if we had this forum in what four of the five past five years, we would probably have to press it, preface it with so we're looking at cuts this year. <laughs> right? um, so it's it's um, I always find it kind of a, a, um, a, a, a challenging dynamic when I'm engaging with the public about what do you want us to invest in, where do you want the budget when we're going to have, when we know that to some degree, we're looking at cutting services, you know, so I think that's, that's, that's another challenge. Um, but, and so maybe, maybe combining some of these things where, where, you know, the beginning, beginning of a forum is a bit of that primer where, you know, we go, we go over like the core basics, like the school committee can advocate for the total pie, but we don't set the total school budget. Right. And the differences between uh, the elementary and, and the other committee that we sit on. And, and when it is good to um, give us feedback in the budget timeline, right? Like don't get to us too late when we can't act on it. Um, and then also what are the forces that are acting on us as a committee to constrain what, what we can possibly do, right? If people say, hey, we should have a new auditorium um, in one of our buildings, we might all agree with that, but, but we know that there, there's con constraints on that. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I like all this. I, it, a lot of this does look like to do items possibly for Dr. Slaughter. So I'm a little hesitant to say, yes, let's do all of it. And then expect Doug to do a lot of it. So I, I would like to hear what Doug thinks about what his level of involvement is because he does a lot for our district. And I wouldn't want to overburden his plate with expectation that, you know, we're just going to write something and say yes and have him go and do it. So, so I'll stop there. Oops, sorry, um, couldn't find my, um, my uh, Dr. Slaughter. Sure. So I think that in, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm happy to do these things that, and they're necessary. And, and some of them are things we've done in various forms in the past. I was having a conversation with one of your regional school committee members today a little bit about these same topics. So it's it's uh, it's something that's been on my mind um, over the last few weeks. Uh, you know, and a fair number of it, especially things like, you know, sort of FAQ or primer type materials are, are ones I definitely think uh, are worth investing some time in getting put together. I think 
um, because of the complexity, uh, I think it's important to sort of structure that in a way that's, uh, you know, it's, it, as I said to someone today, it, you know, the budget is complex, but it's not unknowable. Um, so I think it's about kind of creating, uh, you know, materials that, that are indigestible chunks or, or, you know, but allow for people to go into the really deep detail if they choose to, but also to understand the, the driving forces of, of the different components uh, in, without having to spend, you know, four hours reading, you know, 150 pages and that sort of thing. Um, so certainly a, a, around topics of, of uh, you know, the sort of prime materials, that sort of thing. I mean, I certainly have opinions about how you might want to shape your forum, but at the same time, it's really yours to shape in, in regard to how you want to solicit feedback from folks and, and, and go through that process. Um, but I do think having that, that framework for people, you know, and, and it's, uh, you know, in materials that are available, say through the website, um, having the budget book that, that is, is structured in a way that, that allows for people to follow along as well is, is helpful. Um, and I think that'll help, you know, really, uh, move the conversations in productive ways when you, when you do, go to do forums. Um, and I think that, that it also, you know, that, that can be kind of condensed to a short form each time you have a form. So if you want to have multiple conversations with the public, you can still do a little recap on sort of the things that you can and can't influence the, the decisions you can and can't make, or what are, what are driving the choices you're making. Um, and those, those kinds of things change over time because we, you know, we learn more information about what the town can afford or what the state is affording relative to, to funding. Uh, and that starts to alter the conversation about uh, the choices we're making relative to the, to the broader uh, budget. So um, I'm happy to do as, as many of those things as I can. I think there's some that are, you know, will be distinctly and directly influenced by your choices about how you choose to solicit information from the, from the community at large. Um, but certainly some of the more uh, pragmatic and, and process-based ones. I've I'll, I'll, been thinking about them. I'm going to start over the next few weeks in, in putting those together for you and, and give you something to kind of react to and, feedback, and get, give me feedback on uh, relative to those fairly soon. Yeah, I, I, I do think that, as, you know, there's a lot in here and, and, you know, we've had these conversations before we, you know, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew and that we can handle and rather sort of select a couple of things that we can really do, focus on and, and, and really do well. And I do agree that probably that primer and FAQ can go a long way to, I mean, to a certain extent that becomes evergreen um, and, and can be used, um, you know, in, you know, and just adjusted and tweaked going forward, but it can go a long way to, to helping to build other understanding. I think one of the things that we learned, um, for at least, you know, through the, through the last year's process was the, the challenge that we have both, not just in our own understanding, but also in communicating and helping the community and our um, municipal you know, elected officials and understanding when we're looking at um, a level, you know, cuts and changes to a level services budget, um, which, you know, we, we, we all share the desire and goal to maintain level services and continue to provide the, this, you know, the same quality uh, services that we've provided in, in, in past years. And I think that focus in, in sort of building those tables and charts and explaining the changes adds to confusion because in, in some ways, because it, it's, it's a limited, you know, it's a limited aperture that people are viewing the, the entire budget. And, um, and so we end up having to do a lot more um, questions and, and answering and sort of digging into it that might, you know, taking a different approach to how we present the, the changes or present the spending, um, which gets at sort of the other comment about, you know, showing all um, expenses um, from all funds as opposed to just what are the things that are changing and, and, and what are the municipal funding dollars that sort of we can control. Because um, I think that that's another place where we experienced, or at least I experienced a lot of questions um, from clarification questions coming from the community around, um, well, why is this changing? And really what it wasn't changing, it was the funding source was changing for something. And so we spend a lot of time explaining that, um, that where, where people are actually seeking to just understand what are they expect, what does the expense profile look like in the, in the district? And I think 
um, that that might be another approach that is sort of a piece of this comprehensive <laughs> outline that might, you know, if we bite off just that one thing that might go a long way to helping build understanding across the board. Um, Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. So I was just thinking it, um, to the extent that we can avoid reinventing the wheel, it might be worth looking to um, Massachusetts specific um, budget primers for education. I'm, I'm thinking I, I haven't looked at these at depth, but I know like mass, I think it's mass budget and policy center might have something, um, MASC even might have some helpful things, but um, because I feel like that's actually the one <laughs> the facts is the one piece where there might actually have been work on this that we could um, bring to our district, you know, provide context, but then say, if you're really interested in understanding chapter 70, here's a link or the regulations around um, this, this particular um, question. So I, I just wanted to put that out there, like hopefully we can do that. The other thing I was thinking is it, it, it does strike me as a lot and, and there are folks who, you know, have spent a lot of time thinking about like participatory budgeting and things like that. I'm just wondering uh, to what extent we might be able to, um, you know, we, we've had good luck with Amherst College interns working to support um, Dr. Morris. I'm just wondering if it might be an opportunity to bring in a student from the public policy school, the school of ed, even an undergrad. I'm, I'm just thinking when I was getting my master's in public administration, you know, we had these capstone projects. And this to me seems like something where, you know, thinking through these questions is something that you know, people in our community are doing as students and to the extent that you could use some help, we can use some help thinking there. Anyways, just putting it out there, maybe not this year, but in the future, it might be a, a good project for somebody to assist us with. Mr. Demling. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts on like forum and, and like what the goal of, of this, of these actions are. And you know, like, like, for me, um, whenever we collect input in any way, whether it's a public forum or email or direct conversation or surveys um, or one-to-one or -one interaction, any, anything, it's, if it's about the budget and how we're going to be managing the budget, ultimately it's a piece of information that we'll use to make a determination about, like that we specifically, the school committee, right, will make a determination um, about the budget. And so, and, and, and so if that's the case, then I think like one of the most important things to communicate all throughout this FAQ primer kind of stuff isn't necessarily, well, here's how chapter 70 works and this is what title one is and whatnot. It's what leeway, what practical leeway does the school committee actually have in the budget? Because it's it's true and simplistic to say we have total control over the full budget. I mean, that's that's mass general law, that's the authority and and, and we do. But un unless we are going to dramatically alter the way in which we deliver education, you know, cut 50 teachers or not do music or, you know, not provide special, you know, a lot of the budget um, is already spent by the time uh, we start constructing it for the next year. It's not like, and it's true that we start, you know, it, it is very educational to start from zero and, and show where, where the money is being spent in those buckets. And so I, I really like, Ms. McDonald, what you said before about, about sort of trying to reframe it and present it in that way. I think it's maybe a bit more um, understandable to, to mem members of the public. But I, th I think one of the things that, that you don't really get often, unless you really watch school committee meetings all the time, you're real wonky for this stuff, is that we don't have you know tens of millions of dollars, practically speaking, that we can move around, right? Even though the budget is, is large. Um, and so when we that's so that's that's why we all understand that at the end of the day we're talking about that relatively short list of ads and cuts. Unfortunately, it's been mostly cuts for the last five years. Um, but but that's that's where our input and our decision making is, right? And so um, I think it's a really important point to frame uh, this kind of effort in because we wouldn't want to give the public the wrong impression of well we're just going to sit back and you you tell us what you want and we'll make it happen. Right, um, like we'll, we'll do we'll do the best we can to respond to forums in, in our sort of layered efforts of gathering input in multi, multi, multiple different ways. But but we but we can only practically realistically we're deciding on this kind of context. So I don't know exactly how we describe that, but uh, it to me it's one of the most important points that we can drive home. 
Dr. Slaughter. It's, um, I won't say it's ironic because it isn't at all, but um, the conversation earlier today parallels this one almost exactly. And, and that's exactly one of the points that, that your colleague from the Regional School Committee shared with me today as well, is that uh, that, that understanding of how much uh, movement you as a school committee can make or not make uh, relative to the budget structure. And, and in some ways you, you have a lot of control and in other ways you don't. I mean, um, you know, the buildings we have are a certain size and they require lights and heat and utilities and those things. And they're fairly uh, rigid in their, their price structure as far as what those kinds of things cost. Um, you know, uh, our, you know the, depending on this, the, the, the status of our contract negotiations, our, our contracts uh, drive a huge chunk of, of the spending we have on, on the people that we have. And, you know, a lot of our, you know, the, the lion's share, you know, 80 plus percent of our budget is driven by the people that we have. So broad decisions around things like class size have a, have a bigger impact on, on the budget but most of, of the others are are much more modest in their in their impact or or their um, their impact would be felt over a, a period of years as well. So if you decide to make certain kinds of choices uh, that could influence either increase or decrease the amount of staffing we have or change in the structure in which we do certain kinds of staffing, those tend to play out over multiple years. It's it's difficult to have them have uh, huge impacts in a very very short period of time. That's just the nature of the size that we are and and uh, requirements in which we operate. Um, so that's that's the other thing. And I think to you know to your point there there are uh, a fair number of things that it's it is that we do that are requirements of. Uh, you know there's there's not a choice there are choices about how we do it, but the the fact that we have to do it is is part of what we have to do. And so that that again is is uh, some rigidity in the budget. Um, uh, but conversations about you know how and what and who are the people that we're hiring and what we're asking them to do and that sort of thing are, are where you have more more room but again uh you know you can't suddenly decide not to teach fifth grade right you, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna have to do that so you know that's that's uh you know those kinds of things those kind of of, of pieces are gonna are are strong players in and and strong impacts on the, the size and 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 uh shape of the budget and so there are some limitations on how much General influence any given action has, but but at the same time understanding what those are and and um, you know and and what it, what is the the dynamic the push pull dynamic if you want if someone were to wanted to add something new and what's the sort of counter balancing thing we have to give up in order to make that happen because the resources are not infinite they are they're very much constrained so so I I take the point and and it is one. Have, have been having with some other folks uh, recently, so well, well uh, timed. It's a, it's an interesting question about sort of thinking about what what a forum might be at, at the beginning of a cycle as opposed to towards the end of a this you know like the budget hearing the way we've done it in, in past years, um, which will continue to do a budget hearing. That's a that's a that's a requirement. I'm not saying it's a either or. It's an add. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I would look at it or think about it at a much higher level than what do you want to pay for this year? Um, <laughs> and so, you know, in really thinking, you know, just um, using it as an opportunity to sort of look at, you know, look at our vision, look at our goals, um, look at what, what our, you know, it, you know, the district's multi-year goals are, what we're trying to achieve. And, and, and sort of what are our values? We talk about the budget being a reflection of our values. Um, and it's, I, I would see it, a hearing maybe could be an opportunity for us to say, here's, here's the values that we want to go into this budget season um, and budget planning season with. It's, does that, does that make sense? Are there, you know, just, just to reinforce and reaffirm with the community and other stakeholders that those are the values that that we want to uphold as we go through, um, as, as we go into the budget planning process um, and get that sort of affirmation before we get to the budget hearing where we might be talking about cuts or, or changes. Um, and, and, you know, it's like it could be a cut, but in some cases it's, it's a potentially moving, right? You know, well, we're valuing this over that. And so, you know, it, it's a cut, we, it, you could still be, 
expanding work in, in one particular area, even as you're cutting because you're, you're shifting money, but we would be able to have that conversation knowing, you know, from a values um, based sort of planning that we've had those conversations with our stakeholders ahead of time versus only at the very back end. Ms. Spitzer. So, and thinking about this, I, and you, you've talked a little bit about scale, and I was just thinking, you know, because we're on, at least for this committee, I, I'm just wondering, when we think about the budget, the school budget is part of a larger budget. Like, I know we have authority over all of these things, and when we're talking about, like, an ad here requires a cut here, I think we could think that of a, even at a higher level when we think about the town's budget. And, and so... I, I don't want us to be the only ones taking responsibility for thinking about these trade-offs because I think that we should be demanding the same thing from our count council if they're demanding us to, to, to be thinking about these trade-offs. And, and I think we all should be, I guess. Is, I guess I just don't want to get so in the weeds on the school piece that we, you know, are, because I feel like our schools have been taking these cuts and, and I'm not saying that other departments haven't been and I don't want to get into the like competition across the town in terms of priorities in in this meeting here but i i think it's important that you know we're part of the reason we're doing this is responding to requests from the town council on on issues and i think we should you know to the extent that we can suggest that maybe we we bring this you know conversation up too because I, I do think schools are a priority for our town and um making sure we, we keep that front and center and that the school budget is part of a larger town budget so I don't know how to do that appropriately, but I just want to raise that. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if there's any other comments, particularly from anybody who hasn't spoken yet, <laughs> I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak up. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, just oh, for okay. So no, I just I just wanted to say like I, I mean overall, yeah, I like the general idea of kind of like simple simplifying like how we explain the budget and and, and kind of like doing more of a public outreach. But yeah, I don't I don't have anything in particular to add that's different from anything that's already been said. But yeah, I just like distilling the the process into a more easily digestible. Yeah. I do think, um, and you know, the, Dr. Sato, you mentioned you were talking to um, one of our colleagues on the regional school committee today, and I do think there's opportunity that we can um, build synergies across, like, what is, particularly when it comes to sort of a primer or an FAQ and what we can, what we do have control over or don't have control over as a as a school dis school committee in a district. Um, you know, there's some of that work, hopefully we can sort of combine that so that it's not, you know, so the sum is greater than the parts. There. Um, and I'm hearing general interest in this idea of a forum, um, but we want to consider and think about what that format that might take. Is that correct? Like, um, wanting to maybe come back um, at that or um, just looking, like, just scoping the room on that. Okay. Um, so we will come back in November to, to uh, I think that's our next meeting, um, but when we get to future agenda plan, we can sort of um, look at that. Any other thoughts on this for now? Great. Um, good. That was a, a helpful conversation. Um, so next we have uh, superintendent goals. Speaking of goals and values. <laughs> um, and Dr. Morris. Yeah, and so uh, these are draft goals again for um, this is first read, getting feedback from the committee. The next round I would include the standards and you know, all the things that you're typically used to seeing. 
Um, but I tried to respond accurately to the feedback that um, the guidance document that you talked about in the last two meetings. I also included, you know, in terms of, um, and these are all online, um, I can share the screen, but I prefer probably to see all of you unless that's um, gonna get in the way. A goal really that's focused on curriculum and instruction because the, the feedback was, um, didn't have much on that. And that is one of the superintendent standard categories. And it, one could infer connections to curriculum and instruction, but I wanted to be more explicit. And we do have some two pretty large projects at the elementary level this year that I think should be inclusive of goals. Um, so that's sort of how I approached it. I changed the format a little bit of the goals to have sort of five broad goals and then had kind of sub goals or bulleted points that were really clear on the action steps. Because I think one of the things that I was reflecting back and looking at, at previous goals, it was really helpful that document included like the past goals because it helped me think about what worked and didn't is at times the implementation or artifacts um, felt uh, connected to the goals, but they weren't so delineated at the front end. And I think it's hard for you all to evaluate me based on artifacts on broad goal areas, unless there's more specificity in the goals, because then, you know, it, I think it just leads to a disconnect a little bit in our process. So I tried to be a little more explicit than I have in the past on sort of not just the, the goal area, but more specifically how those goals would be accomplished and the work to be done. I'm open to feedback and maybe it's too specific or I don't know the right grain size. And I'm, of course, open to feedback to, to any of it. Um, but, you know, again, just to go over them very briefly, the first one's really connected to the MSBA process, um, and then also giving your vote tonight, uh, about sixth grade to the middle school. And those two things are, are connected. They're not the same, but they're connected. So I put them in a, a large, uh, more broad goal. The second is around DEI work uh, in our schools, um, both um, at the district level, as well as with the leadership team um, more specifically. The third goal is really around the pandemic, uh, how we're using our funds, uh, from how we're looking at public health, but also about the well-being uh, for students. And you know, that's been challenging during this time. The fourth is really what we, the topic we just spoke about. So I won't repeat myself, but it's around budget engagement and, and budget processes. And the last one's around curriculum instruction, particularly focused on two large projects, which is a curricular review. Uh, originally it was planned and then the pandemic slowed us down, but we do want to talk about mathematics at the elementary level. We've made such great progress, seven through 12. And we certainly need to connect that back um, K to six and sort of an interesting conversation with tonight in sixth grade and how that's situated. But, um, and then there's a new state law that went into effect around dyslexia screener. We're using that as an opportunity, not just to think about dyslexia screener, but to adjust our assessment methodologies um, at the primary grade level, both to look at dyslexia screening, but also to be implementing interventions with the evidence we found, we find. So, that's sort of where um, I was thinking about a broad range of goals that would cut across kind of safety facilities, academic, social, emotional health, and then also engagement. Um, thinking about the four you know, primary goal areas um, or standards that the state has set for superintendents in Massachusetts. So again, I'm open to any feedback, but I, I didn't want to go to the detail of standards and elements until the committee weighed in first. But you know, for the next meeting in November, uh, based on what the final goals document looks like, I would include all of that in there. And again, open any feedback, any other committee, anyone on the committee has? Any uh, comments or feedback from the committee? Ms. Fitzer. I just wanna say, I, I think this is a, I, I like the additional detail. I think that will be helpful um, when it comes time to evaluate do complete the evaluations. Um, and I I fully support these goals. I think if, you know, a lot of this work is work that you're already doing, which I think is a good thing, because I don't, I think we want our goals not to distract you from the core work. And so this is, this to, this to me seems like the core work of the next year that, that we should be focusing on. So thank you for putting these together. They look good to me. I will um, a plus one on the on the format and, and structure. I, I really liked the um, that specificity and sort of the um, the way you you structured these. I um, I think I said this to you just one on one, but I, I really I found um, 
that it was really straightforward and easy to follow. And what I really also appreciate is that they're clearly measurable, um, which to you, and I, I think you alluded to this when you described it as, as the artifacts. It's not, you know, we don't always know what the artifacts will be at the front end. And so then we're, we're having to make those connections at, at when we're writing the evaluation. And here, you know, we, we know exactly what to expect, I think, at this point, and, and it will be um, really clear um, as, as we go through the year. So I really appreciate this, this um, sort of structured format. And I'm um, uh, and, and happy with the, with the goal, the content as well. <laughs> Other comments, Mr. Demling? Uh, yeah, it's like you read a SMART goals uh, primer or instructions guy. It was, no, it's great. Uh, so plus one, oh, what is that, plus two at this point? Um, yes, I, I, I like the specificity. I think it's, um, it, I mean, this is a communications document, essentially. Um, and so I, I, I love the fact that it's, it's clearer on the communication of, of what it is you'll, you'll be um, accomplishing. So I, I also like the content of the goals. Um, my only suggestion to think about is that for a couple of these, um, I would love to um, have the output of it be incorporated into reporting back to the committee in, in a, a longer term trend fashion. So I'm, I'm thinking about things like, um, effectively utilize uh, the COVID relief funds um, that's in goals three and four. So, you know, we're using some of those now, we're adjusting how we're using some of those the course of the year, we have more funds coming in the future, we might talk to the town, you know, so it's like, it's this moving picture. Um, we wanna make sure that we keep on top of, of how we're using those. So not just a snapshot of like, this is what we're spending and this is what we've spent now, and this is what the immediate plan is, but how does this fit into the context so that you know, when you give us the second and the third and the fourth update in the coming years, it's it's familiar and we see the trend. Oh, look, the 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 um the the total pot of ESSER funds is going down, but look what we've we've done with the, the funds, that kind of thing. Um so that that's one topic that I think um uh where sort of trend annual kind of reporting could um could uh could be applied. The other one is is the diversity, equity, inclusion. So like recruiting and retaining staff of color, it's it's great to to get those one shot updates and Ms. Cunningham has given us some fantastic presentations on where we are. Um, but um, but we, we don't always see it in the same format and, 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 and also being able to tie it back to what has happened three years ago, two years ago, and where, where are we at now, right? And so um, to be able to see that, that progress or lack thereof or just the change over time uh, for, for a number of those diversity equity metrics. So it could be about hiring. So in this, in this particular case, you would, you would would be about uh, the percentage of staff of color that we're hiring. But you could also include that in coming up with a, a standard set of, I don't want to get too quantitative and say it has to be metrics, but a, a standard set of report out um, uh, reporting uh, where we say th these are you know the four or five areas in diversity, equity, inclusion, where we want to make sure we're on top of where we're at now, where we've been, where we want to go. Um, I, think, I think that would be really helpful to it from a school committee point of view. Didn't realize I was muted. Any other um, comments? I think um, a plus one, um, Mr. Deming's comment about the sort of trajectory um, and over time, sort of just uh, um, for some of these subtopics, but also to just in general, sort of like using this as an opportunity to um, to report out, share, and communicate sort of the progress that that is being made that you're making over year over year, um, and not just sort of look at it every year just from the perspective of what did we do in these twelve months. Um, and I'm going to connect the dots, and and I'm going to look to other people to call me out if I, if it's I'm, I'm agenda creep. <laughs> <laughs> on this, but I, I do think this connects really nicely with the conversation we were just having about about budgeting and talking about sort of our vision, our values, and our goals, right? And because several of these um, lend themselves directly into talking about, okay, how is that going? How are we going to see that in in future um, in in future budgets? How are we investing 
um, how are you investing, you know, in, or proposing that we invest dollars to support some of this work? So whether it's the, the um, curricular review and potential alignment of mathematics um, curriculum or the new dyslexia screener. So how is the budget supporting your achievement of, and work towards those goals? Um, when it comes to the DEI work, how is the budget supporting the professional development of topics of DEI? How is the budget supporting, um, you know, inclusive practices and and um, you know bias it, responding to bias based concerns? Right. Like so, I think um, you know connecting these dots um, even more and showing sort of that that interweaving of all of these. The goals, really clear goals with sort of clear budgeting priorities and values. Any other? Feedback on the on the goals. Yeah. Great. I think do you do you feel like you have what you need, Dr. Morse? Okay, great. So um, next up is future agenda planning. And oops, I just, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> I, I clicked and I went away from board docs. So forgive me, I'm gonna, it's gonna, when I go back, it's gonna probably take me a moment to go back. But our next meeting, uh, Dr. Morris, I was just going to say, if you want me to just talk about the next meeting and potential agenda topics, you can do that. I'm happy to. I have that document up. I, I have it up. I lost the board docs agenda. Oh, but, okay. um, <laughs> I think for future, I will attach this document into our, our agenda just so that it's all in one place. But our next meeting um, is in November, on November 16th. Um, and it's, it's pretty full. Um, we'll be talking about the OP, so we'll have a um, building project update, um, OPM designer discussion, um, school building um, committee updates, sort of all, all that together, um, ESSER funding plan update, safety and health updates, which we're, we've talked about wanting to have at every one of our meetings. Um, we'll have an update on our fourth quarter budget from FY21. Um, and a look at the first quarter of this fiscal year. Um, and then engagement process for the decision that we just took on six, moving sixth grade to the middle school. Um, and then the budget engagement and forum planning. I believe there was talk, and I'm gonna look to Mr. Harrington and, and Dr. Morris on this one. There was talk, the OPM designer discussion, was that, Intent, intended to be a joint topic with the building committee? Dr. Morris? Uh, yes, but that our timeline shifted back a bit since that because of the posting challenge, not school committee posting challenge, but with um, the procurement pushback. So I think it's going to be a quicker update. Um, and I think there would be a potential joint meeting maybe in December or January, but I believe that's the date if all goes well, that that decision is actually going to be made so that the designer wouldn't actually have a contractor. I mean, they'd be selected by the designer selection panel, which Mr. Harrington and I will sit on, but they, that wouldn't be wrapped up that date. I believe it's, I think the tentative is, I'm gonna double check to make sure I'm correct, but I believe, yeah. So the, I believe in that morning is actually the designer selection panel where the decision will be made. So we'll be able to share that with the committee, but I don't think they'll be able to come that evening. Great, great. Um, and just a preview looking at tentatively, our, um, so our next meeting after that would be December 14th. Um, and tentatively what we've penciled in is we'll have, um, we'll be reviewing the education plan for the, for the school building project along as part of, and, and along with school building committee updates, safety updates, um, and begin talking about um, space planning for next, school year or this school year it says fy22 would that be this year or next year more to come <laughs> any um any questions on uh next agenda okay 
it's just sounding a little full is my only concern is that the meeting in November. Dr. Morris. Yeah, I think with the pushback on the timeline, I think school building committee update can be really brief that one. So I think that will shrink it. I think the ESSER plan update, uh, you know, just given the feedback that we heard when the principals were on, it may make sense to put that off till December because I think that's so integrally tied with space planning for the following year. So we may be able to shift some of those to December and sort of link topics because they're, we can yeah. think of them as two different topics, but really what we, when we're serious about it, it's, it's the same thing, right? It's, we have this funding source. How do we want to make the next um, school year, FY23, as Ms. McDonald noted, uh, my apologies for the error, um, the best. So, so I think some of that we might be able to push, we would want to push off to December so that they're, they're, pink, they're linked. Yeah. I like I like that. Thank you. That's a good suggestion, Ms. Spitzer. And um, I, I believe then we'd also want to uh, review the your goals and vote on those at the November meeting. I didn't see that in there. Um, okay. Uh, Next, we have um, a warrant report, and I believe I have just one. Apologies, my screen's all changed, so I'm pulling it up here. Oh, no, I have, I don't have any, sorry. Um, <laughs> that was a, a contract. Um, and I don't believe we have any gifts this evening. Um, so. I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. I will second that. There's no discussion, so we'll um, take a roll call vote. Mr. Downley. Downley, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Good night.